Chapter Twenty Seven of the Complete Works of Bran, the Iconoclast, Volume One, by William Cowper Bran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Chapter Twenty Seven, an unprofitable controversy. Mr. Gladstone and Professor Huxley have been warmly debating the story of the swine, the devil, and the deep sea. What an occupation for two of the master spirits of the age! Is it any wonder that young men contemplating such polemics should turn away from revealed religion altogether? Fortunately, the religious world is no longer convulsed from centre to circumference by such disputations. The day has gone by when the whole fabric of the Christian religion could be shaken to its foundation by the discovery of an error in biblical chronology or the impossibility of a large whale swallowing a small prophet. Gradually the worship of the Creator is grounding itself on general principles and Christian apologetics is slowly but surely mounting above the particularists spreading a broader opinion leaving to the antiquary and the zoilist the inaccuracies and inconsistencies of tradition all friends of the faith should hasten this movement really it matters not whether the gadarenes whose swine were drowned were jews or gentiles whether christ did or did not cast out devils raise the dead or cause the blind to see it matters not whether joseph or the holy spirit was his immediate father are we not all sons of the most high god and is it not the advent of each and all as much a mystery as though we were begotten without an earthly father spoken into existence or sprang like minerva from the brow of jove why should the world stand a gaze for nineteen centuries at one miracle when sixty full as great as incomprehensible are happening every minute if god is the author of us all is it more wonderful that he should create us in one way than in another was it necessary that the all-father should change the order of generation to prove his existence or that Christ should enter the world in an uncommon manner to establish his claim to preeminence among the sons of God. It is altogether immaterial how Christ came into the world. Sufficient it is for us to know that he came and brought with him hope for sorrowing millions. That he was of God, it required no preternatural birth, no wondrous miracles to establish. It was not the healing he brought to the flesh, but the comfort he administered to the spirit that stamped him divine. Is it possible that in this world of sorrow, sin, and death, where millions are stretching out their hands to heaven and praying for a sign that the loved ones who have crossed the dark river are safe in the bosom of the great All-Father, where millions more are going down to death in an agony of doubt and fear, that Professor Huxley and Mr. Gladstone, science and religion, can find no grander work to do than dispute about the ownership of a herd of swine drowned nineteen centuries ago? When churchmen decline to engage in acrimonious disputation regarding non-essentials, either with non-churchmen or each other, when the churches no longer insist that this or that dogma must be observed or accepted as a prerequisite to salvation, when they study the spirit of revelation more and the letter less, when they admit that all religions that have brought comfort to humanity were divine and seek light wherever it is to be found, whether in the Bible or the Vedas, ethnic philosophy or science, the occupation of the pains and the Ingersolls will be forever gone and religion command the respect of all mankind. In union there is strength, in disunion weakness. If this world is ever to be Christianized, the different denominations must learn that they are not natural enemies, but allies, differently organized corps, 
differently uniformed divisions of one great army instead of wasting their strength warring upon each other in repelling atheistical assaults upon outworks that are a source of weakness and should be abandoned they must swing into line shoulder to shoulder each with its own particular oriflamme and shibboleth if it will and present a solid front to the common enemy which is not the doubter of particular dogmas but that evil of which is born sorrow shame and death when the different divisions of the church which acknowledges christ as its head become mutually supporting and its officers distinguish the real battle from the hasty firing of frightened pickets then and not till then will the banner of christianity float triumphant over a world redeemed then will the fatherhood of god and brotherhood of man be known upon the earth End of chapter 27 An Unprofitable Controversy Chapter 28 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Chapter 28. Garters and Amen Groans. On one page of the Houston Post for Sunday, December 12, I find several columns devoted to our boys and girls. On the next, the following advertisement prominently displayed by a Houston haberdasher. Our Ladies' Garter Department. We can give you an all-silk garter for 50 cents with nice buckles with such reading on them as Private Grounds, Stop, Mama is Coming, Look Quick, Good Night, Call Again, I Am a Warm Baby, Take Off Your Things, etc. The paper contains the usual Sunday morning quota of church notices, religious news, and editorial moralizing, constituting a delectable a la pradrida calculated to turn the stomach of a self-respecting yowler dog. Doubtless many purveyors of garters keep in stock those peculiarly adapted to the trade of the tenderloin, but this is the first time that I have seen such truck advertised in any paper permitted to pass through the mails or enter the homes of respectable people. Imagine a Houston parson rising from family prayers on Sunday morning and placing in the hands of his young daughter a great moral daily, which sets forth in display type that, for the small sum of fifty cents, she can secure a pair of silken garters that warn the great he-world that she's a warm baby, and bid it look quick at her shapely legs. Think of a modest old mother in Israel, watching the face of her youthful son, as he learns for the first time of garters that invite him to take off your things. Fine Sabbath morning reading that, for the so-called Christian people of Harris County. Such an ad would forever damn even the Nashville banner, or show in the feculent columns of the Kansas City Star like a splotch of soot on the marble face of Raphael's Madonna. The Police Gazette and Sunday Sun are debarred from the mails, yet neither ever contained aught one half so horrible. We keep the Decameron and Daudet's eroticisms under lock and key, yet they are only suggestive, while this is frankly feculent, a brazen bid for Baudry. Should the iconoclast publish such a thing, it would be promptly denounced from ten thousand pulpits as a pander to pruriency. Yet, against the iniquity of the daily chippy chaser, alias the Houston Post, not one preacher has raised his voice in protest. Why? Because the dirty rag does not attack their religious dogma does not strike at their bread and butter. The shortest route to the heart of the average parson is through his pocket. Hit him there, and you raise a howl that startles high heaven. Print his church notices, report his foolish little sermons, kneel with him in prayer, slander agnostics and atheists, serve the iconoclast as the foul yahoos did Gulliver, flip a plugged nickel into the contribution box, and you may safely flaunt the patois of the Nif Dupov 
in the fair face of every honest girl between Cape Cod and the Golden Gate. And as it is with the average preacher, so it is with the bulk of his parishioners. The post introduces the language of the prostitute into the parlors of its patrons. It boasts a boys and girls club, the Happy Hammers, of more than six hundred members, and to these children it carries the first knowledge of sexual perversity, gives them their initial lesson in social sin. Were this the paper's first offense, we might attribute it to the carelessness or stupidity of a clerk in its counting room, and the incompetence of its business manager. But it is an old, a shameless, a persistent sinner against all life's decencies and proprieties. Its personal column was for years the most revolting thing known to Yaller journalism. Its counting room was an assignation post office. The paper was the recognized organ of Happy Hollow, the hell's half-acre of Houston. It was a pander to all the worst passions that run riot in the tenderloin, a procurer of young girls to glut the lust of godless libertines. Its sign was the Lignioni, its ideal the almighty dollar. Through its feculent columns, muckle-mouthed Meg and doll Tearsheet made assignations with Forks of the Creek's fools, while blear-eyed bummers and rotten-livered rounders requested respectable women to meet them at unfrequented places and wear camp-meeting lingerie. The iconoclast compelled its unrespected contemporary to purify its personal column, and this service to society has never been forgiven by the bench-legged hydrocephalus grand panjandrum of that paper. The Post next proceeded to publish a directory of Houston's red-light district, giving names and addresses of the madames, the number of their borders, and the condition of the merchandise thrown upon the market. All that was necessary to make the Post's body house guide complete was the addition of rate cards. On that little bit of journalistic enterprise the iconoclast put a kibosh also, much to the satisfaction of every decent family in Harris County. Now the fecular sheet has found a new road to infamy. Its advertising garters fit only to adorn the crummy underpinning of Negro prostitutes. It does seem that the Post will do anything for a dollar, except be decent. Owing to the mental perversity of its management, respectability is for it impossible. It is a social leper, a journalistic pariah. It is devoid of political principle as a thieving tomcat of conscience. It has no more stability than a bad smell in a simoon. It has deified and damned every statesman by turn. It has been on every possible side of every public question, and wept bitter tears of regret because further change of policy were impossible. It is a perfect maelstrom of misinformation, the avatar of impudence, the incarnation of infamy, a social cesspool whose malodor spreads contagion like the rank breath of the gila monster, or the shade of a upas tree. Yet its editor, I am told, aspires to the lieutenant governorship of Texas. Verily, he's got his gall. He will indeed be a warm baby if elevated to that inconsiderable office, and permitted to monkey with the scepter while the governor is doing the elegant elsewhere. Texas may certainly consider herself fortunate if he does not pawn the fasces of power and blow in the proceeds of the erstwhile John Bell's variety joint. Should he do so, he will probably be permitted to take off his things. The post ad is worse than that of Holy John Wanamaker, who once announced in the Philadelphia papers that Parisian thoughts are sewn in our underwear. With such lingerie, I should imagine that call again garters would be the proper caper. Such a combination would suggest the patent medicine certificate of the happy husband who joyfully testified that my wife was so nervous that I could not sleep with her, but after taking two bottles of your remarkable, etc., she has so far recovered that anybody can sleep with her. Just what effect the Parisian thought underwear of Holy John Wanamaker had upon the preeminently respectable people of Philadelphia, I shall not assume to say, but I should consider such goods contraband of war when found on a Sunday school bargain counter. Imagine the result of introducing Parisian thoughts into the unbleached muslin lingerie 
of a lot of single standard of morals old maids. There's really no telling for what Harrison's professional Sunday school superintendent is responsible. He's a rank conspirator against the Seventh Commandment. The post should be abated as an incorrigible nuisance. It is a standing menace to the morality of the community. It has never been a legitimate journal. Its chief sources of revenue have been fake voting contests and unclean ads that range in fascination from abortion pills to garters for prostitutes. What this country seems to need is a press censorship. The second-rate newspapers are mistaking liberty for license. The dogma that public opinion can be depended upon to correct the evil is an iridescent dream. The public will stand almost anything so long as its religious theses and political confessions of faith are let alone. Men claiming to be quasi-decent, if not altogether respectable, will carry home day after day and suffer to be read by their young daughters such a paper as the Houston Post, with its W-Y-O-D and take-off-your-things advertisements, its puffs of abortion pills and syphilitic panaceas, who would have a conniption fit and fall in it should a copy of Bob Ingersoll's eloquent lecture on Abraham Lincoln creep into their library. The stench of such a paper creeps abroad like the malodor of a cloaca, beslimes the senses like the noxious exhalations of an open sewer. How in God's name men can be found so debased as to work on such a sheet is beyond my comprehension. I once undertook to hold down its editorial page but soon got sore at myself, cursed everything connected therewith, from the pink-haired president of the company to the pee-wee business manager, got out, purified myself, and have been sick at the stomach ever since. Should a man lay a copy of the foul sheet on my parlor table, I'd blow his head off with a shotgun. All that I now see of the paper is the clipping sent me by disgusted Houstonians, and I take those out behind the barn to read, then bury them lest they poison the hogs. I regard my temporary connection with the sheet much as Jean Valjean must his tramp through the Parisian sewers. It is a ten-legged nightmare, an infamy that I can never outlive. I strove manfully to make the foul thing respectable, but the Augean stables proved too much for my pitchfork. I managed to occasionally inject into this facilitated sheet a quasi-intelligent idea, to disguise its feculence with a breath of sentiment that by contrast seemed an heir from Araby the Blessed. But the stupid ignorance and dollar-worshipping of the management soon dragged it back into the noisome depths of hopeless nescience and subter brutish degradation. Poor old Houston! A morning newspaper should be a city's crown of glory, an intellectual aurora ushering in the newborn day. But in Houston's case, her chief newspaper is a sorrow's crown of sorrow, her inexpungible badge of shame. End of chapter 28 Garters and Amen Groans Recording by Brian Keenan Chapter 29 of The Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast Volume 1 by William Cowper Bran this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Tavarish. 29. Life and Death In a city beyond far seas there dwelt a youth who claimed not land nor gold, yet wealthier was than sceptred sovereign richer far than fancy ever feigned. The great round earth, the sun, the moon, and all the stars that flame like fireflies in the silken web of night were his, because garnered in the salvatory of his soul. And the bidded dew upon the morning glories, the crimson tins of dawn, iris bended bow, and all the cloth of gold and robes of purple that mark the royal pathway of the descending sun, 
the perfume of all the flowers, the bubble's sensuous song, and every flowing line that marks woman's perfect form he hoarded in his heart and gloated over as a miser does his gain. And the youth was in love with life, and held her to his heart as God's most gracious gift. Ah, beautiful was she, with her trustful eyes of blue, and hair of tangled sunbeams blown about a brow of alabaster, arms of ivory and bust whose rounded loveliness were a pulsing pillow where ever dreamed desire beautiful beyond compare and sweet as odors blown across the brine from the island valley of avalon maddening as lydian music in which swoons the soul of youth while all the passion in the blood beats time in delirious ecstasy and youth and life build fair castles in the air with turrets of sapphire and gates of beaten gold wherein they dreamed the days away on a bed of thornless roses drained the chalice of the honeysuckle ate the lotus bud and thought of naught in all the world but love on this soft dalliance was born a son and life cried with falling tears now i am ashamed nay said the youth for i will hide our child within my heart and none shall know and life laughed and kissed the boy and called him ambition and hid him in the secret recesses of her lover's heart and gaily went and came as though her fair breasts had never burgeoned with a wealth of liquid pearl but the child was restless within its prison house and beat against the wall and grew day by day and fought with teeth and nails until the youth cried out in agony and life said mockingly hast not room enough within thy heart for one poor child to range that heart which holds the earth the sun and stars cast forth the foolish rubbish the rainbow and the flowers the incense and the summer sea make room make room for thine and mine though naught else doth remain he cast them forth with fond regret and ambition grew and filled his heart and strove with all his strength the youth looked no more upon the fair field flowers but thought only of the victor's wreath he heard no melody but fame's shrill trumpet rising ever louder on the blast and saw no beauty but in minerva's laurelled brow the cool sylvan path became a blinding mountain trail his hours of dalliance days of toil and nights of agony the hidden sun had become master of the sire and all the host of heaven melted into a single star which poured its baleful fire into his face the treacherous star of hope and so he strove with augmenting strength his goal the highest, his guerdon the immortalis. But oft he fell and cursed his folly for having left the flowery vale to beat against the barren mountain rocks. But life upbraided him, and with her soft breath fanned the paling star to brighter flame, the star behind which lay the throne and death followed them shadowy indistinct like a spirit wrapped in mist and life mocked at death crying behold the envious trumpet doth follow to despoil me of mine own 
far how uncanny and how cold what lava would hang upon those ashen lips her bosom is marble and in her stony heart there flames no fire with her ambition perishes and the star of hope forever fades her house is a ghastly tomb her bed the granite rock her lover childless for her womb is barren and the youth glancing with a shudder at the figure in the mist drew close to life and echoed her words with trembling lip how uncanny and how cold thus fared he on through many a toilsome year to where no shadow falls to east or west to manhood's glorious noon he looked at the towering heights before him with undaunted eye measuring his strength against the walls of stone he glanced back and a chill swept over him for he was standing far up on the mountain side he was in a barren desert whose level waste stretched back to the pathetic tomb where love was left to starve and sweet content lay festering in her shroud fool cried life why looked ye back like wife of ancient lot now are ye indeed undone the voice was harsh and shrill and starting as from an uneasy dream he looked on life with wide open eyes and soul that understood he found her far less fair than in the heyday of his youth when he reveled in her voluptuous charms and loved her well her face was hard and stern as that of some hag from hell the sunlight had faded from her hair the cestus of red roses become a poisonous serpent her fragrant breath a consuming flame her robe of glory a sackcloth suit begrimed with ashes torn by thorns and stained with blood thou hast changed a life he cried in horror not so she said the change is thine in youth you saw me not but only dreamed you saw she you loved was a creature of your vain imaginings i am life mother of that scurvy brat ambition she pointed upward saying behold thy star is gone and the shining goal hangs pathless in the heavens when the sun hath reached the zenith it must descend henceforth your path leads downward for every hour will sap your lusty strength and every step be weaker than the last until you sink into senility come my love you do not know me yet behold me as i am she cast aside her soiled and ragged robe and stood revealed in all her hideousness a thing of horror her breasts distilled a poisonous dew around her gaunt limbs aspics crawled her eyes were fierce and hollow and in one bony hand she held a scroll on which was writ the record of her frauds and follies her sin and shame come she cried mockingly let us on together you may caress me as in the days of old and i will answer with a curse hold me to your heart and i will wither it with my breath of flame praise me and i will requite you with dishonor and crown you with the gruesome chaplets of grief fool thou hast striven for a prismatic bubble bursting on the crest of a receding wave why scorned you gold and lands to grasp at castles in the air why dreamed of the demurgus when desiring harlots beckoned thee why dealt with open hand and unsuspecting heart 
when thrown mid a world of thieves hadst thou been content and not aspired to rise above the grossness the falsehoods and the folly which is life i would have loved thee well and deceived thee with a painted beauty to the end my foul breasts would have been to thee ever a fragrant bed of flowers you have invaded life's mysteries the penalty whereof is pain you have looked upon the past behold the future he looked and saw a tortuous path winding downward through bogs and poisonous fens and bitter pools in the far distance an old man tottering beneath his weight of years stood leaning on a staff reading a riddle propounded by a sullen sphinx and striving with failing intellect to understand cui bono nearby was an open grave beside which an angel of mercy stood and beckoned him thou hast tarried long my lover she said in a low sweet voice that was the distant note of aeolian harp or summer zephyr soughing through the pines with a cry of gladness he cast himself into her cool arms she touched his tired eyes with her soft white hands she pressed a kiss upon his lips that drained his breath in an expiring gasp of pleasure all passionless and cradled upon her bosom like a weary child he fell asleep the burden and its bearer hallowed by a pale glory as of saint elmo's fire sank into the open grave yet the sphinx sat stolidly holding the painted riddle in his stony hand cui bono but there was none to answer the path faded like the phosphorescent track of a ship in midnight waters and all was dark he turned fiercely to life a question on his lip but ere he could utter it she had answered with a bitter shrug the angel with the pitying eyes the beauteous one my rival death so uncanny and so cold all who love me leave me for this sorceress and she holds them neath the magic of her spell for evermore but what care i i do take the grain and give to her the husk i drink the wine and leave the lees mine the bursting bud hers the withered flower go to her and thou wilt i have slain ambition and blotted thy foolish ignis fatus from the firmament for thee the very sun henceforth is cold the moon a monstrous wheel of blood the stars but aged eyes winking back their tears as they look upon thy broken altars and ruined fanes the grass grown green above the ashes of thy dead go i want thee not for thou hast seen me as i am i am for the red wine and wild revel where in folly's cup still laughs the bubble joy for the idle daydream and the sensuous dance the fond kiss of foolish love and the velvet couch of lust then death came and stood near him beautiful with a beauty all spiritual and world of pity in her eyes but he shrank from her with a shudder seeing which she said am i indeed so cold i who warm the universe is the bosom of mercy to be feared and the breath of peace despised what is life that she should mock me this hideous harlot whose kisses poison and whose words betray is she not the mother of all ills 
behold her demoniac brood hate and horror discord and disease pride and pain she is the creature of time the slave of space she is the bastard spawn of heat and moisture was engendered mid the unclean ooze of miasmic swamps in the womb of noisome fens and i i am empress of all that is or was or can ever be come dwell with me and all the earth shall be thy home thy period eternity wouldst live again then will i make of thy clustering locks grasses to wave in the cool meadows green of thine eyes fair daisies that nod in the dewy dawn of thy heart a great blush rose worn between the breasts of beauty of thy body an oak to defy the elements of thy blood a wave breaking in slumbrous thunder upon a beach of gold of thy breath the jasmine's perfume of thy restless spirit the living brand that crashes in thunder peal above the storm why press the cruel thorn into thy heart the iron into thy soul thus do i clasp thee to a bosom ever true and shield thee from the slings and arrows of the world thy hot heart beats faint and ever fainter gainst its pulseless pillow until it ceases with a sigh and thou art mine and eternal peace is thine End of chapter 29 Life and Death Recording by Tavarish Chapter 30 of the Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast Volume 1 by William Carver Bran This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org this recording is by Voice of Landis, Zanesville, Ohio. Chapter number 30. The Garden of the Gods. Much has been written of Texas by immigration boomers, able editors and others, with an eye single to the almighty dollar. Its healthfulness, delightful climate, undeveloped resources, churches, schools, etc., have been expatiated upon times without number. But little has been said of its transcendent beauty. The average able editor is not a very aesthetic animal. He has an eye for the beautiful, it is true, but his tastes are of the earth earthy. A half-page display ad with woodcut portrait of a chamber set occupying the foreground in the clear obscure worked up with various sizes and styles of black type possesses far more charm for him than does the deep blue of our southern sky whose mighty concave seems to reach to infinity's uttermost verge. A two-story brick livery stable or laundry is to him far more interesting than the splendors of the day god rising from the ocean's blue. An eighty-cent dollar, with its lying legend, more beautiful in his eyes than even Austin's violet crown, bathed in the radiance of the morning or arched with twilight's dome of fretted gold. The able editor cares not for purple hills unless they contain mineral for broad champagnes unless the soil be good, for flashing brooks unless they can be made to turn a mill wheel or a water a cow. The able editor takes it for granted that everybody is as grossly materialistic as himself, care not whether the sky above their heads is blue or black so long as the soil beneath their feet is fertile, whether the landscape be pleasant or forbidding, so long as it will yield them creature comforts. Perhaps he is very nearly right. The fact that millions will make their homes beneath leaden skies, amid scenes of desolation, while there is room and despair in our sunny Southland, is not without its significance, indicates plainly that man has not yet progressed far into that spiritual kingdom where the soul must be fed as well as the stomach. Where sunlight is more necessary than sauerkraut, 
where beauty furnishes forth more delights than beer. Still, there must be a few people in this gang-grabbing world not altogether indifferent to the beauties of nature to whom the gold of the evening sky is more precious than that wrung with infinite toil from the bowels of the earth, to whom the purple of the hills is more pleasing than the crustacean dyes of ancient Tyre, the flashing of clear waters more delightful than the gleam of diamonds, the autumn's rainbow tints more inspiring than the dull red heart of the ruby. To have such a home in Texas were like a sojourn in that pleasant paradise where our primal parents first tasted terrestrial delight. No Alps or Apennines burst from Texas's broad bosom and rear their cold, dead peaks mile above mile into heaven's mighty vault. No Vesuvius belches his lurid, angry flame at the stars like a colossal cannon, worked by titans at war with the heavenly hierarchy. No Niagara churns its green waters into rainbow-tinted foam. The grandeur of Texas is not that of destruction and desolation. Its beauties are not those which thrill the heart with awe, but fill it with adoration and sweet content. Not dark and dreary mountains riven by the bolts of angry Jove. Not gloomy Walpurgis gorges where devils dance and witches shriek. Not the savage thunder of avalanche, but the sun-kissed valley of Kashmir. The purple hills of the Lotus Eater's land. The pastoral beauties of Temp's delightful vale. Here is repeated a thousand times that suburban home which Horace sang. Here the coast where Odysseus, the much-enduring man, cast anchor and declared he would no longer roam. Here the Elysian fields, far beyond the sunset. Here the valley of Avion lies, deep meadowed happy, fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows, crowned with summer sea, where queens nurse the wounded hero back to life. Here the lost Atlantis, new found, the land where it is always summer, where airs softer than those of Araby the blessed are ever blowing. Skies bluer than ever arched, famed, Tuscany bid earthworms look heavenward. Sunsets, whose gleaming gold might ransom a universe. What care I who owns this broad expanse of emerald mead and purple hills? Who pays the taxes and digs and delves therein for gain? It is all mine. In the sky above it is mine to the horizon's uttermost verge. The flashing waters, the cool mists creeping down the hill, a soft breeze stealing up from Neptune's watery world with healing on its wings, still fragrant with spices of the Spanish main. All, all mine. A priceless heritage which no man toiled for, which no spendthrift can cast away. End of chapter 30 The Garden of the Gods Recording by Voice of Landis, Zanesville, Ohio Chapter 31 The Complete Works of Brand, The Iconoclast, Volume 1 By William Cowper Bran this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Chapter 31 Woman's Wickedness Chastity Going Out of Fashion By the social evil is commonly understood illicit intercourse of the sexes, a violation of law or custom intended to regulate the procreative passion. The evil is probably as old as society, coeval with mankind. History, tradition itself, goes not back to a time when statutes, confessedly human or professedly divine, were capable of controlling the fierce fires that blaze within the blood, when all-consuming love was cold reason's humble slave, and passion yielded blind obedience unto precept. Although the heavens have been ever peopled with threatening gods, and the great inane filled with gaping hells, although kings and courts have thundered their inhibitions forth, 
and society turned upon illicit love medusa's awful frown the paphian venus has flourished in every age and clime and still flaunts her scarlet flag in the face of heaven the history of humanity its poetry its romance its very religion is little more than a joseph's coat woven of love's celestial warp and passion's infernal woof in the loom of time for sensuous cleopatra's smiles mark antony thought the world well lost for false helen's favors proud ilion's temples blazed and the world is strewn with broken altars and ruined fanes with empty crowns and crumbling thrones blasted by the self-same curse in many cities of every land abandoned women are so numerous despite all these centuries of law-making and moralizing that they find it impossible to earn a livelihood by their nefarious trade are driven by sheer necessity to seek more respectable employment the supply of public prostitutes is apparently limited only by the demand while the number of kept women is constantly increasing and society becoming day by day more lenient to those favorites of fortune who have indulged in little escapades not in strict accord with the seventh commandment it is now a common occurrence for a female member of the four hundred who has confessedly gone astray to be received back on an equality with her most virtuous sisters in ancient sparta theft was considered proper but getting caught a crime modern society has improved upon that peculiar moral code adultery if the debauchee have wealth is but a venial fault and to be found out a trifling misfortune calling for condolence rather than condemnation it is not so much the number of professed prostitutes that alarms the student of sociology as the brutal indifference to even the semblance of sexual purity which has taken possession of our social aristocracy and which poison percolating through the underlying strata threatens to eliminate womanly continence from the world if despite all our safeguards of law and the restraining force of religion society becomes more hopelessly corrupt if with our advancing civilization courtesans increase in number if with our boasted progress in education and the arts women of alleged respectability grow less chary of their charms if the necessities of poverty and the luxury of wealth alike breed brazen bawds and to multiply cuckolds it is a fair inference that there is something radically wrong with our social system it might be well perhaps for priests and publicists who cease launching foolish anathemas and useless statutes at prostitution long enough to inquire what is driving so many bright young women into dens of infamy for those good souls who are assiduously striving to drag their fallen sisters out of the depths to study the causes of the disease before attempting a cure i say disease for i cannot agree with those utilitarians who profess to regard prostitution as a necessary evil who protest that the brute passions of man must be sated that but for the scarlet woman he would debauch the vestal virgin i do not believe that almighty god decreed that one half of the women of this world should be sacrificed upon the unclean altar of lust that the others might be saved it is an infamous a revolting doctrine a damning libel of the deity all the courtesans beneath heaven's blue concave never caused a single son of adam's misery to refrain from tempting so far as he possessed the power one virtuous woman never governor fishback of arkansas recently declared that houses of ill fame are necessary to city life and added if you close these sewers of men's animal passions you overflow the home and spread disaster this theory has been adopted by many municipalities courtesans duly licensed their business legitimized and accorded the protection of the law if houses of ill fame be necessary to city life 
if they prevent the overflow of the home of bestial lust and the spread of disaster it follows as a natural sequence that the prostitute is a public benefactor to be encouraged rather than condemned deserving of civic honor rather than social infamy will governor fishback and his fellow utilitarians be kind enough to make a careful examination of the quasi respectable element of society and inform us how large an army of courtesans will be necessary to enable it to pass a baking powder purity test governor fishback does not appear to have profited by pope's suggestion that the proper study of mankind is man or he would know full well that the presence in a city of prostitutes but serves to accentuate the dangers that environ pure womanhood he would know that they add fuel to lust's unholy fires that thousands of them are procuresses as well as prostitutes and that one bad woman can do more to corrupt her sex than can any libertine since the days of sir launcelot he would likewise know that so perverse is the nature of man that he would leave a harem filled with desirous hurus more beautiful than ever danced through mohammedan dream of paradise to dig pitfalls for the unwary feet of some misshapen country wench who was striving to lead an honest life as a muley cow will turn from a manger filled with new-mown hay and wear out her thievish tongue trying to coax a wisp of rotten straw through a crack in a neighbor's barn so will man turn from consenting venus matchless charms to solicit scornful Diane. what is it that is railroading so large a portion of the young women to hell what causes so many to forsake the straight and narrow path that is supposed to lead to everlasting life and seek the irremediable way of eternal death what mad fantasy is it that leads so many wives to sacrifice the honor of their husbands and shame their children is it evil inherent in the daughters of eve themselves is it lawless lust or force of circumstances that adds legion after legion to the cohorts of shame or has our boasted progress brought with it a suspicion that female chastity is after all an overprized bauble that what is no crime against nature should be tolerated by this eminently practical age we have cast behind us the myths and miracles proven the absurdity of our ancestors most cherished traditions and brought their idols beneath the iconoclastic hammer in this general social and intellectual house-cleaning have we consigned virtue to the rubbish-heap or at best relegated it to the garret with the spinning-wheel hand-loom and other out-of-date trumpery time was when a woman branded as a bod hid her face for shame or consorted only with her kind now if she can but become sufficiently notorious she goes upon the stage and men take their wives and daughters to see her play camille and kindred characters this may signify much among other things that the courtesan is creeping into social favor even that a new code of morals is now a building in which she will be the grand exemplar as change is the order of the day and what one age damns its successor oft-times deifies who knows but an up-to-date religion may yet be evolved with bacchic revels for sacred rites and a favored prostitute for high priestess were i called upon to diagnose the social disease did any duly ordained committee from the numerous reform societies ministerial association secular legislatures or other bodies that are taking unto themselves great credit for assiduously making a bad matter worse call upon me for advice anent the proper method of restoring to healthy life the world's moribund morality i would probably shock the souls out of them by stating a few plain facts without troubling myself to provide polite trimmings you cannot reform society from the bottom you must begin at the top 
man physically considered is merely an animal and the law of his life is identical with that of the brute creation continence in man or woman is a violation of nature's edicts a sacrifice made by the individual to the necessities of civilization like a beast of the field man formally took unto himself a mate and with his rude strength defended her from the advances of other males such reduced to the last analysis is the basis of marriage of female chastity and family honour rape and adultery were prohibited under pains and penalties and behind the sword of the criminal law grew up the moral code as wealth increased man multiplied his wives and added concubines but woman was taught that while polygamy was pleasing to the gods polyandry was the reverse that while the husband was privileged to seek sexual pleasure in a foreign bed the wife who looked with desiring eyes upon other than her rightful lord merited the scorn of earth and provoked the wrath of heaven for long ages woman was but the creature of man's caprice the drudge or ornament of his home mistress of neither her body nor her mind but as the world advanced and matter was made more subject unto mind as divine reason wrested the sceptre from brute force woman began to assume her proper place in the world's economy she is stepping forth into the garish light of freedom is realizing for the first time in the history of the human race that she is a moral entity that even she and not another is the arbiter of her fate and as ever before new-found freedom is manifesting itself in criminal folly liberty has become a synonym for license the progressive woman the woman who is not only well up to date but skirmishing with the future is asking her brother if thou why not i if man is forgiven a score of mistresses must woman blessed with like reason and cursed with kindred passions be damned for one lover and while the question grates upon her ear the answer comes not trippingly to the tongue i do not mean that all women who imagine themselves progressive are eager to assume the same easy morals that from time immemorial have characterized the sterner sex but this line of argument peculiar to their class while not likely to make men better is well calculated to make foolish women worse the sooner they realize that he deans are as scarce in the country as brains in the head of a chrysanthemum dude that such sexual purity as the world is to be blessed withal must be furnished by the softer sex the better for all concerned that they will eventually cease their altogether useless clamour that bearded men become as modest as blushing maids and agree with the poet that whatever is is right the lessons of history bid us hope when the french people threw off the yoke of the royalist and aristocrat they likewise loudly clamoured for equality fraternity and other apparently reasonable but utterly impossible things until the bitter school of experience taught them better the progressive women have not yet set up la belle guillotine in washington or elsewhere for the decapitation of male incorrigibles which significant fact confirms our old faith that the ladies rather like a man who would not deliberately overdo the part of joseph but the female reformer with her social board of equalization theories is but a small factor in that mighty force which is filling the land with unfaithful wives and the potter's field with degraded prostitutes when the people of a nation are almost universally poor sexual purity is the general rule simple living and severe toil keep in check the passions and make it possible to mould the mind with moral precepts but when a nation becomes divided into the very rich and the extremely poor when wilful waste and woeful want go hand in hand when luxury renders abnormal the passions of the one and cupidity born of envy blunts the moral perceptions of the other then indeed is that nation delivered over to the world the flesh and the devil 
when all alike are poor contentment reigns the son grows up a useful self-reliant man the daughter an industrious virtuous woman from this class comes nearly every benefactor of mankind it has ever been the great repository of morality the balance wheel of society the brain and brawn of the majestic world divided into millionaires and mendicants the poor man's son becomes feverish to make a showy fortune by fair means or by foul while his daughter looks with envious eye upon milady follows her fashions and too often apes her morals the real life is supplanted by the artificial and people are judged not by what they are but by what they have the true love match becomes but a reminiscence the blind god's bow is manipulated by brutish mammon men and women make marriages of convenience consult their fortunes rather than their affections seek first a lawful companion with a well-filled purse and then a congenial paramour the working girl soon learns that beyond a few stale platitudes fired off much as a hungry man says grace she gets no more credit for wearing honest rags than flaunting dishonest silks that good name however precious it may be to her is really going out of fashion that when the world pretends to prize it above rubies it is lying is indulging in the luxury of hypocrisy she likewise learns that the young men really worth marrying knowing that a family means a continual striving to be fully as fashionable and artificial as those better able to play the fool seek mistresses rather than wives she becomes discouraged desperate and drifts into the vortex much is said by self-constituted reformers of the lachrymose school anent trusting maids betrayed by base-hearted scoundrels and loving wives led astray by designing villains but i could never work my sympathies up to the slopping over stage for these pathetic victims of man's perfidy it may be that my tear glands lack a hair-trigger attachment and my sob machine is not of the most approved pattern perchance woman is fully as big a fool as these reformers paint her that she has no better sense than a blind horse that has been taught to yield a ready obedience to any master to submit itself without question to the guidance of any hand will the progressive woman who is just now busy boycotting colonel breckinridge and spilling her salt tears over his discarded drab kindly take a day off and tell us what is to become of this glorious country when such incorrigible she idiots get control of it it is well enough to protect the honor of children with severe laws and a double-shotted gun but the average young woman is amply able to guard her virtue if she really values it while the married woman who becomes so intimate with a male friend that he dares assail her countenance deserves no sympathy she is the tempter not the victim true it is that maids and matrons too as pure as the white rose that blooms above the green glacier have been swept too far by the fierce whirlwind of love and passion but of these the world doth seldom hear the woman whose sin is sanctified by love who staked her name and fame upon a cowardly lie masquerading in the garb of eternal truth never yet rushed into court with her tale of woe or aired her grievance in the public prints the world thenceforth can give but one thing she wants and that's an unmarked grave may god in his mercy shield all such from the parrot criticisms and brutal insults of the fish-blooded pharisaical female whose heart never thrilled to love's wild melody yet who marries for money puts her frozen charms up at auction for the highest bidder and having obtained a fair price by false pretenses imagines herself pre-eminently respectable in the name of all the gods at once which is the fouler crime the greater social evil 
for a woman to deliberately barter her person for gold and lands for gewgaws social position and a preferred pew in a fashionable church even though the sale be in accordance with law have the benediction of a stupid priest and the sanction of a corrupt and canting world or in defiance of custom and forgetful of cold precept to cast the priceless jewel of a woman's honour upon the altar of illicit love give the latter woman a chance forget her fault and she will become a blessing to society an ornament to heaven the former is fit inhabitant only for a hell of ice she has deliberately dishonoured herself her sex and the man whose name she bears and custom can no more absolve her than the pope can pardon sin she is the most dreadful product of the social evil of unhallowed sexual commerce is the child of mammon and medusa the blue ribbon abortion of this monster bearing age End of chapter thirty one woman's wickedness Chapter 32 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by William Jones. Chapter 32 Talmage the Turgid. That man who first coined the phrase nothing succeeds like success had a great head talmage is emphatically a success viewed from a worldly point of view he attracts the largest audiences of any american preacher his sermons are more extensively printed more eagerly read than those of any other divine he is regarded by the public as the greatest of modern preachers and he evidently thinks this verdict a righteous one why this is so, I am at a loss to determine. I have read his sermons and writings with unusual care, hoping thereby to discover in what particular he towers like Saul above his brethren, wherein he is greater than the thousands of obscure pulpit-pounders who do battle with the devil for a few dollars and a destructive donation party per year. But so far I have signally failed i have yet to see in print a single sermon by the so-called great talmage remarkable for wit wisdom or eloquence or a single scrap from his pen that might not have been written by a sophomore or a young reporter i have before me while i write one of his latest oratorical efforts entitled bricks without straw it was delivered to one of the largest audiences that ever crowded into the great tabernacle is considered above the Talmagian average, and was evidently regarded as one of his ablest efforts. For the great daily in which I find it prefaces it with a three-story head, a short biographical sketch, and a portrait of the speaker making an evident effort to look wise. Yet such a sermon delivered before a Texas congregation by a fledgling D.D. seeking a call would provoke supercilious smiles on the part of those people who considered it their painful duty to remain awake at the close of the services the good deacons would probably feel called upon to take the young men out behind the church and give him a little fatherly advice the burden of which would be to become an auctioneer or seek a situation as a spouter for a snake side show had bricks without straw been written as a sunday special by a horse editor of any daily paper in texas the managing editor would have chucked it into the waste-basket and advised the young man that journalism was not his forte it is a rambling fragmentary piece of mental hodgepodge in which scraps of school book egyptology garbled bible stories false political economy and fragments of misapplied history tumble over each other like spectres in a delirium it is just such a discourse as one might expect from the lips of a female lieutenant in the salvation army 
who possessed a vivid imagination, a smattering of learning, and a voluble tongue, but little judgment. The only original information I can find in the discourse is to the effect that when Joseph was a bare-legged little Hebrew, making mud pies in the land of his forefathers, his daddy called him Joe, that the Bible refers to Egypt and Egyptians just two hundred and eighty-nine times, and that Egypt is our great-grandmother. He goes out of his way to denounce as lunatics those who would place the American railways and telegraphs under government control. He is quite sure that the logical effect of such a proceeding would be the revival and free America of the old Egyptian tyranny. The analogy between a tyrant enslaving his subjects by means of a monopoly of the food supply, and a free people managing a great property for their own advantage, could only be traced by a Talmagian head. During the few months that Mr. Talmage was pottering about in the land of the erstwhile pharaohs, examining mummified cats and drawing a fat salary for unrendered services, he evidently forgot that in his own, his native land, the people rule the roost, that the government is but their creature and has to dance to music of their making. If the distinguished gentleman had spent his vacation in the hayloft in close communion with a copy of the Constitution of the United States, and a primary work on political economy, instead of gadding from the pyramids to the Acropolis hunting for small pegs upon which to hang large theories, perhaps he would be able to occasionally say something sensible. Of course, in sloshing around over so wide a field, Mr. Talmage gave his hearers his truly valuable opinion of Mohammedanism. He admitted that it is a religion of cleanliness, sobriety, and devotion, but the fact that its founder had four wives caused him to sweat in agony. Polygamy, according to Mr. Talmage, blights everything it touches. Those who practice it are, he is quite sure, the enemies of womankind. Is it not a trifle strange that from so foul a root should spring such a celestial plant as the Christian religion? That from the loins of a polygamous people should come an immaculate Christ? How can we mention Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without a curse, or think of a God whose teachings they followed without horror? Unless indeed we take issue with the public and vote, Mr. Talmage, an ass of the longest-eared variety. Mr. Talmage is quite sure that God was on the side of the Allies at the Battle of Waterloo, that he was on the side of the Russians during the French invasion. Mr. Talmage does not take it upon himself to explain, however, how the deity chanced to be on the other side at Marengo and Austerlitz. No wonder that war is a risky business if the god of battle changes his allegiance so erratically and without apparent provocation. Mr. Talmage should advise the government to cease expending money for ironclads and coast fortifications. In case of a foreign complication, it were all day with us if the autocrat of the universe were swinging a battle axe against us, while if we chanced to have him with us, we could send Baby McGee out with the jawbone of a hen, and put the armies of the world to shame. Mr. Talmage should retire to some secluded spot, and make a careful analysis of his sermons, before firing them out to the press. They may sound all right in the big tabernacle, where a great volume of noise is the chief desideratum, but they make very poor reading. Like a flapjack, they may tickle the palate when served hot and with plenty of sop, but when allowed to grow cold, are stale, flat, and unprofitable. Mr. Talmage is troubled with a diarrhea of words, and should take something for it. Perhaps the best possible prescription would be a long rest, of a couple of centuries or so. How in God's name the American people ever became afflicted with the idea that he is a great man, is a riddle which might make Oedipus cudgel his wits in vain. He is not even a skilful pretender, shining like the moon, by borrowed light, for he does not shine at all. 
His sentences are neither picturesque, dramatic, nor wise. His so-called sermons are but fragmentary, and usually ignorant allusions to things in general. He seldom or never encroaches upon the realms of science and philosophy, although he frequently attempts it, and evidently imagines that he is succeeding admirably when he is but sloshing around like a drunken comet that is chiefly tail in inane limbos. I can find no other explanation of Mr. Talmage's distinction than that, like Elliot F. Shepherd, he can be more kinds of a fool in a given time than any other man in his profession. That were indeed distinction enough for one man, well calculated to cause the world to stand to gaze. Notoriety and fame have, in this age, become synonymous, if not exactly the same. The world gauges greatness by the volume of sound which the aspirant for immortal honors succeeds in setting afloat, little caring whether it be such celestial harp music as cause Thebes' walls to rise, or the discordant bray of the ram's horn which made Jericho's to fall. And Mr. Talmage is emphatically a noise producer. From the lecherous but learned and logical Beecher, to the gabbling inanity now doing the drum major act, is a long stride. End of chapter 32 Talmage the Turgid Chapter 33 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by William Jones. Chapter 33 Nude Art at Chicago now the very old nick is to pay at the world's fair and an exasperating stringency in the money market the great uncultured west is flocking to chicago to see the show and is seen more than it bargained for its modest cheek has been set aflame by the exuberant display of the nude in art and the west is kicking kicking with both feet kicking like a bay steer who has a kick coming and knows how to recalcitrate the cultured east and blase europe look on with mild astonishment and wonder what ails the barbarians don't you know we learn from our chicago correspondent that the great buildings are liberally adorned with figures of nude men of heroic size not a detail of which has escaped the loving care of the fond du siècle sculptors. Elsewhere, the examples of the nude represent both sexes. Yet the East wonders that the West is shocked, cannot understand why wives drag their husbands away, and young ladies leave the building with faces ablaze with indignation. Our correspondent volunteers the information that a much severer test of the patience of the Western people will come when the art palace is opened. Also, that the treatment the Western people are getting is drastic and cruel, but it will work wonders in cultivating and refining them. We beg leave to dissent from the conclusion. We hardly think that any of our readers will accuse us of prudery, we are willing to concede special privileges to art. Its province is to portray the beautiful, and the most beautiful thing on all God's earth is a perfect female form. The painter or sculptor who loves his art may be permitted to reproduce in modest pose a naked female figure, but he should not be allowed to force it upon the attention of a mixed multitude. Let him place it where it will only be seen by those who seek it. A man may take his mother, wife, even his sweetheart, to look upon such a work of art, and they may be better, purer, nobler, for having worshipped at the shrine of beauty. But to compel them to stand before it, with a mixed multitude to most of whom it suggests but grossest sensuality, 
is a brutal crime against modesty. So much for the female nude. What man would take a woman near and dear to him to look upon a nude male statue or painting, not a detail of which has escaped the loving care of the artist? Certainly few Western or Southern men would do so. Worship of the beautiful may pardon the nude female figure, but the nude male figure never. Hercules nude is but an animal, and Apollo a nightmare. To place nude male figures indiscriminately about the great fair buildings, where they must be seen by modest maids, whether they will or no, and that while insolent strangers enjoy their confusion, is the very apotheosis of brutality. The idea that such an outrage upon divine modesty will cultivate and refine people sounds like one of Satan's satires. We honor the uncultured West for making a heroic kick, and trust that it will keep on recalcitrating until every unclean statue forced upon its attention in the name of art is forever disfigured. The protest of the West proves that its mind is still pure, that it has not yet reached the plane of culture, where modesty perishes in the frost of formalism. The liberty accorded art has degenerated into license. The beautiful is no longer sought, but the bizarre. It is not the massy shoulders of Hercules, the rounded arm of Juno, the beautiful bust of Hebe, the godlike pose of Apollo, or the shapely limb of Aphrodite, that painter and sculptor seek to reproduce. It is an effect, similar to that of Boccaccio, or a fragrant French novel, it is not against the true in art that the West is rebelling, but against the vulgar. End of chapter 33 Nude Art at Chicago Chapter 34 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Jim Gallagher. Chapter 34 There's One Comes After A Sketch None so poor, but they may build fairy castles in the air. None so wretched, but they may fondly gaze upon the fickle star of hope flaming ever in that heaven we see by faith. A man, worn with suffering and sorrow and sin, was toiling homeward in the night from a far hunter's camp, whither he had been banished by a doctor's edict. Rest from labor, lest ye die. That, indeed, is a misfortune, he had said, and redoubled his vigils at the desk. Then they brought his little son, the last gem in the sacred circle of home, whose breaking up broke his heart and placed the child upon his knee. He looked at his fair face and said, I will go. A man for whom the shadows should still be falling toward the west, but old before his time, deep scarred by angry storms, battered and bruised like some presumptuous mortal who had seized his puny spear and plunged into such wars as the titans were wont to wage upon the Grecian gods. The jaded steed stumbled along the dark and dangerous way, while its rider dreamed with wide-open eyes and sometimes muttered to himself in that dreary solitude. There's one comes after. In dying, I do not die. In losing, I simply pass the sword from sire to son. I may but fill a ditch for a better to mount upon and win the mural crown. What then, if that other be? The owl hooted as he passed, and from the thicket came the angry snarl of wolves. How human! he bitterly exclaimed. Hoots and hungry howls all along life's path, a weird pilgrimage in the dark. He nodded, his head bowing almost to the saddle-bow, then awoke humming he knew not why. As long as the heart knows passion, as long as life, as long. His dog, a powerful mastiff, bristled and uttered an angry growl as a great gray wolf slunk along in the dry grass but a few yards distant. The brutes follow the wounded, he muttered and I am stricken deep. He unslung his heavy fowling piece and fired. 
The eyes of the brute glowed like green globes of phosphorescence in the light of the gun, then sank down with a howl that drew its comrades about it, not to succor and to save, but to tear and rend. He watched them a moment, muttering again, how human, and turning to an aged oak that spread its branches wide, built a fire of brush and bivouacked. But he could not sleep. The blue devils were playing at hide-and-seek within his heart, and phantoms that once were flesh came trooping from out the gloom and hovered round him. He put out his hands to them, he cried to them to speak to him, but they receded into the darkness from whence they came. The grave gave up its dead, only to mock him, to emphasize his utter desolation. He embraced the sturdy oak as though he would draw strength from its stubborn heart which had defied the storms of a thousand years, then sank prostrate at its base, and with only dumb animals to note his weakness, wept as only strong men weep when shivered by the bolts of destiny. One left, but one of those I loved. My strength is broken, my labors are in vain. I can but die. Yet must I live, lest the one in whom is centered all my hopes doth fall in evil ways, and also come to naught. He dreamed of the days that were dead, and of those rushing upon him from the mystic future, each bearing its burden of sorrow. He tried again life's thorny path, from the cradle to manhood's somber noon, a path strewn with wreck and wraith, and wet with blood and tears. Again the well-known forms came from beyond the firelight, and, winding their shadowy arms about his neck, wept for his loneliness. He tried to embrace them, to gather them to his heart as in the old days, when they welcomed his homecoming with glad acclaim, but clutched only air, his kisses fell on vacancy. As they receded into the gloom he followed, crying, Stay! Stay! and wandered here and there through bogs and briars and over the rough rocks, calling them each by name with many an endearing term, until he fell exhausted and, putting forth his hand to break his fall, encircled the neck of his faithful dog, and lay there bruised and bleeding. Then other phantoms came, two women, one old, one young, bearing a ghastly burden, around which little children wailed. They laid it down at his feet, a horrid thing, with wide staring eyes and gaping wounds all wet with gore. And the elder bowed herself upon it, and kissed the rigid hands, the lips and hair, and moaned that she was left childless in her age. But the younger stood erect, imperious, the frightened children clinging to her skirts, and calling him by a name that froze his blood, bade him look upon her widowhood. It was self-defense, he doggedly replied, as he met the glance of her scornful eyes. Oh, egotist, she cried, must a man die that a dog may live? Must a mother's gray hairs be brought in sorrow to the grave? Must the heart of a wife be crushed within a bloody hand? And children never know a father's loving care, that such a thing as thou mayst yet encumber this fair earth. Precious indeed must be that life, purchased at such a price. But again the forms that had fled returned, and one, a frail, sweet-faced woman, with a world of pity in her eyes, stood between him and his accuser. She took the scornful woman's hand and gently said, Sister, twas thee or me, twas thine or mine and in the music of her voice the ghastly object vanished. The hoot of the owl and the howl of the wolf grew faint and far away. He fell into an uneasy slumber and saw himself, aged and gray, trying to keep pace with a fair youth, who mounted with free and graceful step, a mountain whose summit was crowned with the light of everlasting day. Steeper and steeper grew the path, yet he strove with failing strength. The youth reached out a strong hand to him and said, Lean on me! But he put it back, crying fiercely, No, no, climb thou alone, farther I cannot go. On, on to the summit, where breaks the great white light, and there is no death. The youth struggled with the steeps, and overcame them one by one, and mounted higher, and ever higher, until he stood where never man had stood, the glory of the gods upon his face, the immortelles upon his brow. And people wondered and said to him, who is it that stands upon the mountain top, who only tread the gods? And he answered, It is I, it is my other self. And they said, The poor old man is mad. Let be, let be. The dog crept closer to its master and laid its head upon his breast. The vision changed, and he sat by a sea-coal fire, in chambers that once had echoed the glad voices 
of those whose graves were mid the soughing pines. He held his one treasure to his heart, and sang to it the old ditties that his mother was wont to sing when soothing her babe to slumber, until the golden head drooped low upon his breast. He wove about it fond dreams of what should be in the years to come, when, grown to manhood, it entered the arena of the world. A bony hand stole over his shoulder and seized the child, and looking up he beheld death standing by his chair. He clasped his treasure close and struggled with the grisly spectre, but it only mocked him, and tearing the child from him fled into the outer void. He struggled to his feet, and from his parched lips there burst a cry that echoed and re-echoed through the dark woods, and went sorrowed back from the distant hills. At dawn the rustics found him, lying cold as his rocky bed, the beaded dew upon his grizzled beard, his horse with head low hanging over him, his dog keeping watch and ward. End of chapter 34 There's One Comes After Recording by Jim Gallagher Chapter 35 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast Volume 1 by William Cowper Brand This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 35 Poor old Texas. Twas said in days of old that misfortune never comes singly. The fates are turning upon Texas an unkindly eye. She is overwhelmed quite, sunk in the Serbonian bogs of dark despair. First, our mighty democratic majority slipped up on the hoggy and banana peel and drove its vertebrae through the crown of its convention plug while unfeeling populists and republicans jeered and flouted us then our blessed railway kermission lost its linchpin and the soulless corporations heaped coals of fire upon our heads by reducing rates thereby making our boasted wisdom a byword and a reproach. The cyclone swooped down upon us from Kansas and swiped our crops, making our boasts that here was an Elysium beyond the storm belt sound as hollow as Adam's dream of Eden after he was lifted over the garden wall. Still, we bore up and presented a bold, if not an unbroken front to a carping world. But the vials of wrath were not yet exhausted. Pandora's box had not yet emptied itself of all its plagues. Our sorrow's crown of sorrow was yet to come. It is here. Our humiliation is accomplished. Our agony is complete. A lone highwayman has held up and robbed a populous passenger train in Texas. In West Texas. The rendezvous of the sure enough bad man who catches catamounts and clips their claws. Who defies whole barrows o' Jersey lightning and uses the bucking bronco for his laughter, yea, his sport. Shades o' Ben Thompson and Luke Short, has it come to this? That a rank stranger can lasso a Texas train, drive the passengers under the seats, plunder them at his pleasure, with no one to molest or make him afraid? Half a hundred Texans trembling at sight of one gun were a sight worth seeing, and they did not even know it was loaded. Gone is our ancient glory, our rep is irretrievably in the terrain. Henceforth, when a pilgrim from the pathless southwest registers at an eastern hotel, 
The bellboys will not fall over each other to do him honor as a dime novel hero, nor the gilded clerk ensure his life before politely requesting him to pay in advance. The last lingering shadow of our greatness hath departed. The tenderfoot will trample upon us, and the visiting capitalist neglect to ask us up to the bar. The fair ladies of other lands will no longer worship us as the picturesque knights of a reckless but romantic chivalry. They will remember that in a whole trainload of Texans, there was not one who would fight even on compulsion, will sweep by with frigid hauteur, leaving us to weep for the days that are no more. Alas, poor Texas. End of chapter 35 Poor Old Texas Chapter 36 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by William Jones. Chapter 36, The Seventh Commandment. A correspondent wants to know what I think of the single standard of morals, which assumes that tampering with the seventh commandment is as demoralizing to men as to women. The single standard of morals, like the single standard of money, would be a magnificent thing were there at least double the present amount of raw material for it to measure. I hope to see the day when the libertine will be relegated to the social level of the prostitute where he logically belongs. But we are not dealing now with theories, but with actual conditions. I trust that I may speak plainly on this delicate subject without offending the unco quid or giving the purient pulpiteers a pain. I believe the sexes should be equally pure. When I make a world, all my women shall be pure gods of virtue, and all my men he virgins. I'll construct no Messalinas nor Cleopatras, no Lovelaces or Sir Lancelots. I'll people the world with St. Anthony's and Penelope's, Joseph's and Rebecca Merlindy Johnsons. I'll apply the soft pedal to the fierce scream of passion, and pull all the barbs from the arrows that whiz from the love god's bow. Life will not then be quite so exhilarating, but it will be much better worth the living. Meantime, a little spraining of the seventh commandment is by no means so demoralizing to man as to woman, despite the frantic protests of those who would drag the millennium in by the ears by forcing them upon society willy-nilly the single standard of morals. Man is the grosser animal, has not so far to fall. The shock to his sensibilities is not so serious. He is not so amenable to shame. A coat of black paint ruins a marble Diana, but has little appreciable effect on an iron Hercules. Illicit intercourse is not so demoralizing to man as to woman, for the further reason that it is not considered so great a crime. An act is demoralizing or degrading in proportion as the perpetrator thereof considers it criminal, as it lowers his self-respect and men regard their crinolinic peccancy as a venial fault, while women consider such lapses on the part of their sex as grievous sin. Hence the lightning of lust scarce blackens the pillar, while it shatters the vase. The moral effect of an act is determined by the prevailing standards of ethics. Were polyandry the general practice, a woman could have a multiplicity of husbands and be considered pure. Where polygamy is the rule, a man may have a multitude of wives and be regarded as moral. Ethical codes ever adapt themselves to conditions. Solomon was one of the most honorable men of his age, but were he alive today, he would be branded as a shameless lecher 
a contumacious criminal. There have been religions, existing through long ages and extending over vast empires, in which the organs of generation were considered as sacred symbols, and prostitution in the purlieus of the temple regarded as pleasing to the gods. It is easy enough for a bigoted ignorance to brand those people as barbarians, but in many provinces of art and science they have ever remained our masters. Quote, the tents of the maidens, end quote, were simply places where fair religious enthusiasts sold themselves to the first stranger who offered them a piece of silver and laid their gains upon the altar of the gods. The robber barons of old-time Germany, the diplomatic liars of medieval Italy, the thieves of ancient Lacedaemon, and the polygamists of biblical Palestine considered themselves as respectable people and as they were so regarded by their compatriots, they were not morally degraded by their deeds. But the robber and the liar, the thief and the polygamist of this age, are cattle of quite a different color. There has been a radical change in the moral code. The peccadilloes of the past have become the crimes of the present. The cross, once an obscene pagan symbol, has been transformed from an emblem of reproduction to one of destruction. The tents of the maidens are struck. Corinth no longer implores the gods to increase the number and enhance the beauty of its courtesans. Vetus Pandemos has given place to Our Lady of Pain, and the obscene Dionysius fled before a crucified Christ. No more does the fair religious postulant play the bacante in flower-strewn palaces, while naked cupids crown the brimming cup and sandaled feet beat time on the polished cedar floors to music that is the cry of brute passion in the blood. Kneeling in the cold gray dawn upon the stones, she clasps a marble cross. The wanton worship of the flesh has passed with the world's youth. But though much of man's crassness has been purged away in time's great crucible, he is still of the earth, earthy, and clings tenaciously to his ancient prerogative of polygamy. When he marries, society does not really expect him to respect his oath to forsake all others, regards it as a formal bow to the convenances, a promise with a mental reservation annex. But it considers a woman's vow as sacred, and the breaking thereof as rankest blasphemy. He is allowed but one wife, but he may have a score of mistresses, and society will placidly wink the other eye, until some tearful maiden requires him to share the shame she can no longer conceal, or an injured husband goes a-gunning. This should not be so, but so it is. There be fools, both male and female, who will rise up to exclaim that this is false but that it is gospel truth is proven every day in the year in every community on the American continent. Men with reputations for licentiousness that would shame old Silenus are cordially received in the most exclusive society. They are found at every highfalutin function, bending over the white hands of the most accomplished ladies in the land, on every ballroom floor encircling the waists of debutantes in the parlors of our best people, paying court to their young daughters. The noblest women in this world become their wives, fondly undertake their reformation, while indignantly drawing their skirts aside lest they come in contact with the tawdry finery of females whom these lawless satyrs have debauched. Of course, when a woman learns that her reformatory work has proven a failure, drear and dismal, she complains bitterly, may even demand a divorce. Yet she could count upon the fingers of one hand the hubbies whom she would trust behind a sheet of paper with a wayward daughter. She doesn't believe a little bit in the virtue of the genus male, yet insists that her own husband be a saint, assumes that her own charms should cause him to regard all other women with indifference, and when she learns of his polygamous practices, suffers all the pains of wounded pride. If a woman be homely as a bois dark hedge, she may suppose the world supercharged with St. Anthony's, 
for she has not been much sought. But if she be beautiful, and has mingled much with men, she realizes all too well that the story of Joseph is a foolish romance, or that Mrs. Potiphar was quite passé, and though she be pure as a vestal virgin of Rome's best days, she secretly despises the man with whom she does not have to stand just a little bit on the defensive. Of course, she demands that her male acquaintances shall be gentlemen, and treat her with due courtesy and respect. But it nettles her, not a little, to learn that her charms are altogether ignored. She likes to feel her power, to know that she is good in the eyes of men, something desired, that her virtue is a priceless jewel over which she must ever keep close guard. Hence she likes best the male she is compelled to watch, while a man has absolutely no use for wife or mistress, upon whose fealty he would not lay his life. The result is that when a woman commits one sexual sin, she puts hope behind her, her feet take hold on hell, she sinks lower and lower until she becomes the shameless associate of bummers and bods. She is made to feel that she has murdered her womanhood, that the red cross of Cain blazes upon her brow. Realizing that she is a social outcast, a moral pariah, she becomes reckless, defiant, and finally glories in betraying the fool who trusts her. No matter how fair the mountain upon which she has leave to feed, she will batten on the moor. Love was her excuse when first she went astray, and she hugs the delusion to her heart that Cupid can sanctify a crime. But where honor spreads not its wings of snow, love perishes in the fierce simoon of lust. The man with whom she enters the primrose path feels that he is as good as his fellows. He may watch with a sigh her descent into the noisome regions of the damned, but comforts himself with the reflection that she would have found her way to Hades without his help. That, quote, virtue as it never will be moved, though lewdness court it in the shape of heaven, so lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey upon garbage. Close quote that had he played the prude, she would have found another, and perhaps a baser paramour. He knows that the stain of lechery is on his soul, but draws comfort from the fact that such is the common heritage of his sex, forgets his victim, and struggles toward the stars. He is financially honest, generous, and guards the honor of wife and daughters as God's best gift. His amorous dalliance with others, instead of weaning him from his wife, causes him to regard her with greater veneration, to contrast her purity with his own pollution, her virtue with another's vice. Paradoxical as it may appear, there are no men in this world who so reverence good women as those who are notorious for their illicit amours. I am not, of course, speaking of the consorts of common courtesans, of human hogs, but of the men who people the red-light district with their cast-off mistresses. Pitiful as it may appear, it hurts a man more to trifle with the Eighth Commandment once than to break the Seventh a thousand times. He is worse demoralized by stealing a mangy mule than by ruining a maid. The male lecher may be in all things else a lord. The thief is considered altogether and irremediably corrupt. Society will tolerate the one if his offense be not too flagrant, but to the other it refuses even the shadow of forgiveness. For three centuries the world has been trying to explain away Shakespeare's poaching, but it has not thought it worth while to even apologize for his sexual perversity. Washington caught his death while keeping an assignation with a neighbor's wife. But there's little said about it. He's still the father of his country, including 70 million people of all classes and colors. Had the slight exposure, which brought on a fatal sickness, been the result of prowling in his neighbor's barn instead of his boudoir, his name would be an anathema forevermore. 
The world forgives him for debauching another man's wife, but it would never have forgiven him had he raided the same man's hen roost. It does not mean by this that a scrawny pullet is more of importance than family honor. It simply means that the man who steals a pullet is a cowardly thief, while the one who ignores the advances of a pretty woman is an incorrigible idiot. Ben Franklin could have mistresses scattered all over the city of brotherly love, and Dan Webster consort with all the light women of Washington, and still be men of genius beneath whose imperial feet Columbia was proud to lay her shining hair. But had either been caught sneaking from a neighbor's woodpile with a two-cent bundle of faggots, the world would have rung with his infamy. The complaint against Demosthenes is not that he was a libertine, a man before whose honeyed eloquence maiden modesty and wifely virtue were as wax, but that he threw away sword and shield and fled like a mule-eared rabbit before the spears of Macedon. I digress longer enough to say that I have patiently investigated the story of the great orator's flight, and am fully convinced that it was a foul political falsehood, just as the current story of Colonel Ingersoll's cowardice and capture is a religious lie. Of course, society has to make an occasional example, and its moral maleficence, like death, loved a shining mark. It damned Breckenridge for getting tangled up with a desiring maid in a close carriage, and relegated him to the political wilderness. Yet, twice elevated to the presidency the most disreputable old Falstaff that ever vibrated between cheap beer joints and ham-fatted old washerwoman who smelled of stale soap suds and undeodorized diapers. Cleveland told the truth when he had to, and was made a little tin Jesus of by the moral jabberwocks. Breckenridge, an infinitely better and brainier man, fessed up and couldn't go to Congress from the stud horse district of Kentucky. When society goes hunting for scapegoats, it usually manages to get a gnat lodged in its esophagus while relegating a mangy dromedary to its internal economy. Such are the conditions which prevail today. But I am far from agreeing with the dictum of Pope that, quote, whatever is, is right, close quote. Had the world ever proceeded on that principle, we would still be honoring robbers and liars, thieves and polygamists. The wider license accorded man harmonizes neither with divine law, decency, nor the canons of common sense. We place womanly virtue on a pedestal and worship it while tacitly encouraging men to destroy it. We overlook the fact that a man cannot fracture the seventh commandment without considerable assistance. We should adopt a loftier standard of morality, nobler ideals for men. Because he is more earthly than woman, it does not follow that he should be made altogether of muck. He has made some little progress since the day of Judah and Tamar, David and Bathsheba. He no longer consorts with courtesans on the public highway, nor pins up half a hundred wives in a harem, then goes broke buying concubines. He has learned that there is such a thing as shame, assumes a virtue, though he has it not, seeks to conceal his concupiscence. What in one age society drives to a semblance of concealment, in the next it brands as criminal. Hence we may hope that at no distant day the single standard of morals will become more than an iridescent dream, that Joseph's will not be confined altogether to gum-chewing members of the Y.M.C.A. We may eventually reach that moral plane where the male debauchee will be considered a moral outcast, but the time is not yet, and until its advent illicit commerce will continue to be more demoralizing to women than to men. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. There are women who rise superior to the social law. George Eliot, Queen Elizabeth, Sarah Bernhardt, and others have trampled the social edict beneath their feet and refused to consider themselves sinners, have left an outraged world to scorn and stood defiant, sufficient unto themselves. 
those women were intellectual Amazons whom naught but the writhen bolts of God could humble, whose genius flamed with a white light even through the dun clouds of lechery. But we cannot measure the workaday woman by the few whose minds might, like the elements, furnish forth creation. A Bernhardt is great, not because of her social sin, but despite thereof. With her, art is the all-in-all, all. sex but an incident. She is strong enough to mount the Empyrean, despite the Lernian serpent coil which drags others to perdition, to compel the world to tolerate, if not forgive, the black stain in her heart because of the divine radiance which encircles her head. Occasionally there is a woman who can sacrifice her purity without sinking to the slums through loss of self-respect, can still maintain the fierce battle for fame, can be grand after she has ceased to be good. Mrs. Grundy can rave, and every orthodox goose stretch forth its rubber neck to express its disapproval. But instead of bending beneath the weight of scorn, instead of sinking into the mire of the slough upon which she has set her feet, she seems like old Antaeus, to gather fresh strength from the earth with which to write her name among the immortals. Queen Elizabeth is, to this good day, the pride of orthodox England. She had more brains than all its other monarchs combined. Yet, by solemn act of Parliament, it was decreed that the first bastard born to the Virgin Queen should ascend to the throne of Britain. Thus was the highest possible premium placed upon female lechery, and it was placed there after due deliberation by a God-fearing, Catholic-hating, Episcopalian Parliament. Fortunately for Mrs. Wetton, the present governmental figurehead, jolly old Liz, either availed herself of some of the preventatives so extensively advertised in great family newspapers, or neglected to own her illegitimate offspring. I cannot help but think that a love child by Elizabeth and the courtly Raleigh would have been a great improvement on any of the soggy-headed things spawned by the House of Hanover. I do not apologize for, nor condone, the sexual frailties of distinguished females. The noblest career to which any woman can aspire is that of honest wifehood, and if she attains to that she is, though of mediocre mind, infinitely superior to the most famous wanton. It is worthy of remark that most distinguished women since the days of Sappho and Semiramis have been impure, while not a few great men have been remarkable for their continency. Woman has been called the weaker vessel, and certain it is that men stand the glamour of greatness, the temptations that come with riches, the white light that beats upon a throne, much better than do Eve's fair daughters. As a man becomes great, he respects more and more the cumulative wisdom of the world, becomes obedient. As a woman becomes great, she grows disdainful and rebellious. Thus it is that while in the common walks of life woman is infinitely purer than man, as we ascend into the higher realms, whether in art, letters, or statecraft, we discover a tendency to reverse this law until we often find great men anchorites and great women trampling on the moral code. There may be some who explain man's larger sexual liberty on physiological grounds, excuse it on the hypothesis of necessity. Physicians of the ultra-progressive school have even gone so far as to assert that continence in man is the chief cause of impotency, have pointed out that it is usually the wives of good men who go wrong, and insisted that to the former hypothesis must be attributed the latter fact. I am unable to find any reason in physiology why such a rule should not work both ways. I have said somewhere that man is naturally polygamous, and I might have added with equal truth that woman is naturally polyandrous. The difference is that women's sexual education 
began earlier and she has progressed somewhat further from a state of nature wherein free love is the law man early began to defend his prerogatives to strengthen the moral concept of his mate with a club to frame laws for the protection of his female property the infraction of established custom soon came to be considered a social crime an offence of which even the gods took cognizance woman's polyandrous instinct yielded somewhat to education she was compelled to make the sacrifice upon the altar of society thus was female continence not a thing decreed by heaven or natural law but was begotten of brute force we see a survival of the old animalistic instinct in prostitution and the all too frequent illicit intercourse prevailing in the higher walks of life unquestionably the seventh commandment is violative of natural law as applied to either sex but most natural laws must be amended somewhat ere we can have even a semblance of civilization hence we cannot excuse men's peccadilloes on the broad plea that it's the nature of the brute joseph and st anthony gautama and sir galahad are ideals toward which man must ever strive with all his strength if he would purge the subsoil out of his system would mount above the gutter where wallow the dumb beasts and take his place among the gods the custom of thousands of years to the contrary notwithstanding it is damnable that a wife should be compelled to share a husband's caresses with lewd women tennyson assures us that as the husband is the wife is fortunately for society this is false still there are thorns in the bed and rebellion in the heart of the woman who must play wife to a loveless or a lancelot it is not true that it is the wives of good men who go astray it is the wives who are naturally corrupt or morally weak a talented lady contributor to the iconoclast once asserted that tis not for good women that men have done great deeds perchance this is true for men who do great deeds are goaded thereto not by the swish of crinoline but by the immortal gods such acts are bred in the bone are born in the blood and brain it certainly is not for bad women that men soar at the sun for every man worth the killing despises corruption in womankind he worships on bended knee and with uncovered head at the shrines of minerva and dion but amuses himself by stealth at that of the pandemian venus when antony deserted his roman wife for egypt's sensuous queen he quickly became an enervated ass and his name thenceforth was ichabod great caesar dallied with the same dusky wanton but ever in his intrepid heart ruled that woman above reproach alexander of macedon refrained from making the wife of persia's conquered king his mistress napoleon found time even among the thunders of war to write daily to his wife and when he finally turned from her it was not to seek a fairer flame but to place a son upon the throne of france grant stood forth in an era of unbridled license unsullied as a god great men have been unfaithful through their marital vows but it has been those of mediocre minds and india-rubber morals who have cowered at the feet of mistresses who have thrown their world away for reachy kisses shared by others while it is true that the world's intellectual titans have seldom been he virgins or feathered saints they did not draw godlike inspiration from their own dishonor end of chapter thirty six the seventh commandment chapter thirty seven of brand the iconoclast volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording is by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana 
Chapter Thirty Seven Optimism versus Pessimism The Preacher and the Apostle I am in receipt of a long letter from a Missouri minister in which, to my surprise, he says, I regret to note that you are a pessimist. Permit me to express the hope that so powerful a journal as the iconoclast will yet espouse the sunny philosophy of optimism, which teaches that all that is accords with the plan of the Creator and works together for the ultimate good. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. End quote. I had not hitherto suspected that I was inoculated with the awful microbes of pessimism. But if my reverend friend is a professor in the sunny school of optimism, I certainly do not belong to that sect. If all that is accords with the plan of the Creator, did not Christ deserve to be crucified for bringing about new conditions, and Galileo to go to jail for interfering with the stupid ignorance of certain Catholic cardinals? Can even the Missouri minister be held guiltless when he attempts to turn my thinking apparatus around and make it operate from the other end? Surely he should not interfere in even so slight a particular with the plan of the Creator, who may have been moving in a mysterious way his wonders to perform when he gave the supposedly pessimistic bend to my mind. Nay, if my Christian friend do but have the rheumatism, should he not refrain from poulticing himself, lest he throw the celestial machinery out of gear? If changes wrought in religion, science, and government, etc., constitute a portion of the plan, we must concede it to have originally been a very faulty affair, quite upsetting the optimistic theory that whatever is, is right. The terms pessimism and optimism are handled very loosely in these latter days. In the modern acceptance of the terms, the first may be defined as a chronic intellectual bellyache, the latter as an incurable case of mossbackism. The thorough pessimist believes the world is going in hot haste to the demnition bow-wows, and that nothing short of a miracle can head it off. The full-fledged optimist carries concealed about his person an abiding faith that God ordereth all things well, that he not only designed the mighty universe, but is giving his personal attention to the details of its management." Really, I do not believe I am a pessimist to hurt, or that my reverend critic is so dangerously ill of the optimistic disease as he imagines. Perhaps he has been living too high for great intellectual effort. Were he in the condition of some millions of his fellow creatures, the cuticle of whose abdomens is flapping against their vertebrae, like a wet dish rag wrapping itself around a wire clothesline, perhaps there would not be quite so much sunshine in his philosophy. The man with whom the world goes well is apt to prattle of the ultimate good when considering the woes of other people. The basis of optimism is for ordination, the foolish faith that before God created the majestic universe and sent the planets whirling about the blazing sun, that before the first star gleamed in the black overhanging firmament, or a single mountain peak rose from the watery waste, he calmly sat him down and mapped out every act of moral man, decreed every war and pestilence, the rise and fall of every nation, and fixed the date of every birth and death. That may be excellent orthodoxy, but it is not good sense. I reject the theory that all the happenings here below accord with the plan of the Creator, work together for the ultimate good. Hence, I am not an optimist. I dare not accuse my Creator of being responsible for all the sin and sorrow, suffering and shame that since the dawn of history has bedewed the world with blood and tears. I do not believe the plan of the Creator contemplated that millions of people should perish miserably by war and famine and pestilence. I do not believe the black buck who ravishes and murders a white babe is one of the great moral agents of the Almighty, nor that the infamous act has any possible tendency to promote the ultimate good. And did I believe so, I would keep my shotgun loaded just the same. 
i do not believe that the blessed god intended there should ever be a liar or a thief a prostitute or a murderer in this beautiful world i do not believe that the creator entered into a compact with the devil or a covenant with the cholera and if not then all that is does not accord with the plan of the creator if that be pessimism make the most of it that there is a divine plan i do not doubt but i believe it to be broader deeper more worthy of the great demurgus than that which pictures him telling a priest how to carve his pantaloons or sacrifice a pair of pigeons than standing idly by with his hands under his coat-tails while some drunken duffer beats the head off his better half with a boot-jack or a bronze brute rips the scalp from a smiling babe if that's the kind of a hair-pin who occupies the throne of heaven i don't blame lucifer for raising a revolution i would have taken a fall out of him myself even had i known that my viscera would be strewn across the face of the shrinking universe god gave us life and this grand old globe for habitat he stored it with everything necessary to the health and happiness of the human race poured his treasures forth with a hand so bounteous that though its population were doubled trebled it might go on for ever and no mortal son of adam need suffer for life's necessaries the gaunt spectres of want and pestilence are not of his creation they were born of greed and ignorance god sent no devil with hoofs and horns to torment and tempt us he gave to us passions necessary to the perpetuation and progress of the race and divine reason wherewith to rule them then left us to work out our own salvation aided by those silent forces that are pressing all animate and inanimate life onward to perfection reason needs no celestial guide no heavenly monitor for it is the grandest attribute of god himself where reason sits enthroned god reigns for more than half a million years man has been toiling upwards impelled by that mysterious law that causes the pine to spring towards the sun sometimes the advance is by leaps and bounds as when some giant intellect some son of god especially gifted with the attributes of his sire brushes aside the obstructions at which lesser men toil in vain sometimes the car of progress stands still for a thousand years else rolls slowly back towards brutishness there being none of sufficient strength to advance the standards further up the rugged mountain side nearer the celestial city thus ever in ebb and flow gaining and losing only to regain nations rising and falling but to serve as stepping-stones whereupon mount a nobler race a grander people the irrepressible conflict of the godlike with the beast-like in man goes bravely on in half a million years we have come far won many a fair field from the dominion of darkness we no longer dwell in caves and hollow trees fighting naked with the wild beasts of the forests for our prey we have erected temples to the god that dwells not only in the heavens but here on earth in the brain and heart of the human race we have made matter so far subject unto mind that nature's mighty forces have become our obedient bond slaves we have built societies nations weighed the world and measured the stars we have acquired not only knowledge and power but love and modesty the procreative passion no longer crawls a hideous thing but soars aloft a winged psyche thus one by one through the long ages have we built up within ourselves the attributes of the most high toward whom our feet are tending life is no longer mere animalism content to gorge itself with roots and raw meat and sit in the sun the ear craves melody the eye beauty the brain dominion while the soul mounts to the very stars thus far have we come out of the valley of darkness led on not by those who believe that all there is accords with the plan of the creator but by those whose battle cry has ever been forward forward let us range let the great world spin forever down the ringing grooves of change 
every reformation yet wrought in religion science or politics was the work of men who declined to accept the doctrines enunciated by the missouri divine if i am a pessimist i am in such excellent company as confucius and christ general washington and mr gladstone professor morse and dr pasteur while my critic is training with the gang that poisoned socrates bribed iscariot and crucified the saviour and the world persists in judging a man by the company he keeps end of chapter thirty seven optimism versus pessimism chapter thirty eight of the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume one by william cowper brand this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by cornel nemesh Chapter 38 Adam and Eve After God had expended five days creating this little dog kennel of a world and one in manufacturing the remainder of the majestic universe out of a job lot of political bull material, he planted a garden eastward in eden and there he put the man he had formed adam was at that time a bachelor therefore his own boss he was a monarch of all he surveyed and his right there was none yet to dispute he could stay out and play poker all night in perfect confidence that when he fell over the picket fence at 5 gm he would find no vinegar-faced old female nursing a curtain lecture to keep it warm setting her tear jugs in order and working up a choice assortment of snuffles there were no lightning rod agents to inveigle him into putting one hundred dollars worth of pot metal corkscrews on a fifteen dollars barn he didn't care a rap about the law of rent nor who paid the tariff tax and no political bus fuzz bankrupted his patients trying to explain the silver problem. He didn't have to anchor his smokehouse to the center of gravity with a log chain, set a double-barrel bear trap in the donjon keep of his henry, nor tie a brace of pessimistic bulldogs in his melon patch, for the nigger preacher had not yet arrived with his adjustable morals and omnivorous mouth no female committee of uncertain age invaded his place of business and bancoed him out of a double sawback for the benefit of a pastor who would expend it seeing what parkhurst saw and feeling what parkhurst fell collectors for dry goods emporiums and millinery parlors did not haunt him like an accusing conscience and the pestiferous candidate was still happily hidden in the womb of time with the picnic pismeyer and the partisan newspaper adam could express an honest opinion without colliding with the platform of his party or being persecuted by the professional heresy hunters. He could shoot out the lights and yoop without getting into a controversy with the chicken court, 
and being fined one dollar for the benefit of the state, and fleeced out of forty for the behoof of thieving officials. He had no collar buttons to lose, no upper vest pockets to spill his pencils and his patience, and his breeches never bagged at the knees. There were no tailors to torment him with scraps of ancient history, no almond-eyed he washerwoman to starch the tail of his Sunday shirt as stiff as a checkerboard. Adam was more than one hundred years old when he lost a rib and gained a wife. Genesis does not say so in exact words, but I can make nothing else of the argument. Our first parents received special instructions to be fruitful and multiply. They were given distinctly to understand that was what they were here for. They were brimming with health and strength for disease and that had not yet come into the world. Their blood was pure and thrilled with the passion that is the music of physical perfection. Yet Adam was 130 years old when his third child was born. If Adam and Eve were of equal age in marriage in American high life, the mating of a scorbutic dude with a milliner's sign could scarce make so poor a record. After the birth of Set, the first of man, begot sons and daughters, seems to have become imbued with an ambition to found a family. As the first years of a marriage are usually the most fruitful, we may fairly conclude that our common mother was an old man's darling. Woman does not appear to have been included in the original plan of creation. She was altogether unnecessary for it God could create one man out of the dust of the earth. Without her assistance, he could make a million more, could keep on manufacturing them as long as his dust lasted. But multiplication of masterpieces was no part of the Creator's plan. Adam was to rule the earth even as Jehovah rules the heavens. As there is but one Lord of heaven, there should be but one Lord of earth, one only man who should live forever, the good genius of a globe created not for a race of marauders and murderers, but for that infinitely happier life which we denominate the lower animals. This beautiful world was not built for politicians and preachers, kings and cuckolds, but for the beasts and birds, the forests and the flowers, and over all of life animate and inanimate the earthly image of almighty god was made the absolute but loving lord the lion should serve him and the wild deer come at his call the bold eagle whose bold wings seem to fan the noonday sun to fiercer flames, should bend from the Empyrean at his bidding, and the rock bear him over land and sea on its broad pinions. As his great archetype rules the cherubim and seraphim, so should man, a god in miniature, reign over the earth-born, the inhabitants of a lesser heaven.
As no queen shares God's eternal throne, so none should divide the majesty of earth's diadem. There is neither marrying nor giving in marriage, we are told, among the angels. They rise above sex into the realm of the purely spiritual, scorning the sensual joys that are the heritage of bird and beast for intellectual pleasures that never pall. And why should men, the especial object of God's providence, be grosser than his ministers? Were I a poet, I would ask no grander theme than Adam's first century upon the earth, that age of gold when man was sufficient unto himself, a century undisputed master of the world, a century of familiar converse in Eden's consecrated groves with the great first cause, the omnipresent and omnipotent God. Picture one day of such existence. Ambition and avarice, jealousy and passion, those demons that have deluged the world with blood and tears have no place in Adam's peaceful bosom. He's not in the grove of Daphne where lust is law, but in the garden of God where love is life. His subjects, no dumb as now, or speaking a language strange to our dull ears, greet him as he comes forth at break of day from his aromatic bower. A thousand feather songsters drown his soul in melody divine, while every bud and blossom a living censer sway in the balmy breath of morn and pours forth its grateful perfume. The forest monarch lays his massive head on Adam's knee. The spotted leopard pours about him and the fawn nestles between his feet. High above the Caucasian peaks, a condor poises motionless in mid-heaven, the unrisen sun guiding him as with the beaten gold. Now the saw-like summits, cloud-kissing and crowned with eternal snow, burst into the brilliant sea and gleam like the brow of gold, while the purple mists are drawn up from the deep valleys, as though the giants fain would hide from earth their splendors, reserving them alone for heaven. Higher and higher wills the great sun, driving the river mist before it and sending down through the softly whispering foliage a thousand shafts of burnished gold that seek out the violet drain the nectarious dewdrop from its chalice and kiss the grape until its youthful sap changes to empurpled blood beneath the passionate caress in the cool shadows by the great spring a magic mirror in whose pellucid depths are reflected heaven's imperial concave and Eden's virgin splendors, God walks familiar with Adam as with a younger brother, explains to him the use and beauty of all that is, and spreads before his wandering eyes creation's mighty plan. And yet God suspects that Adam is not content, for we hear him 
soliloquizing. It is not good that the man should be alone. The clay of which the first of man is formed is beginning to assert itself. He watches the panther fondling his playful cubs. The eagle's solicitude for his imperial brood perched on the beetling crag and the paternal instinct awakes within him. He hears the mocking bird thrilling to his mate, the dove pitying the loneliness of creation's mystic lord, and in the fierce longing for a companionship dearer than he has yet known, takes possession of him. To the swarming life about him, his high thoughts are incomprehensible. In God's presence, his soul swoons beneath an intellectual glory to which he cannot rise, encumbered as he is by earthly clay. He sends his swift-winged messenger forth to summon before his throne every fowl of the air and every beast of the field. Down through the gates of the garden they come, countless thousands, and pass before their king. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. Sick at heart he turns away. The sunset has lost its glory, the spheres their music, life its sweetness. The beams of the moon chill his blood, and Arcturus leads forth his shining suns, but to mock his barrenness. The flowers that wreath his couch stifle him, with their sensuous perfume, and he flies from the nightingale's passionate song as the slave flees the scourge. Through the dark paths and over the most grown boulders he stumbles on, across the fields where the fireflies glow like showers of flame, Beneath the tall cedars whose every sigh seems drawn from the depths of an accepted lover's soul. Exhausted, he sinks down where the waters burst from the foundations of the earth and, dividing into four, seem to reiterate in ceaseless monotone, Behold my mighty sons! A feeling of utter loneliness, of hopeless desolation, falls upon him, such as hammers at the heart when death has despoiled us of all that life held dear. He pillows his head upon the sleeping lion and shields himself from the sharp night air with the tawny mane. A cub, already hunting in dreams, comes whining and nestles down over his heart, while love's brilliant star pours its splendors full upon his face. The long black lashes, burdened with unshed tears, drop low. A drowsiness falls upon him, and Adam sleeps. The heavens are rolled together like a scroll, and God descends in the midst of a legion of angels, brightest of whom is Lucifer, son of the morning, not yet forever fallen. It is not good that the man should be alone. The fitful slumber deepens. The winds are hushed. The song of the nightingale sinks lower and lower. 
then ceases with an awestruck sigh. The lynx and the jackal, the horned owl and the scaly serpent slink away into the deepest wood, while love's emblem glows like a globe of molten gold. Then comes a burst of melody divine, beneath which the earth trembles like a young maid's heart when, half in ecstasy, half in fear, she first feels burning upon her own the bearded lips of her life's dear lord. It is the morning stars singing together. There is a perfumed air on Adam's cheek, sweeter than ever swooned in the rose garden of Kashmir or the jasmine bowers of Araby the blessed. There is a touch upon his forehead softer than the white dove's fluttering bosom. There is a voice in his ear more musical then Israfil's marshalling the faithful in fields of asphodel, crying, Awake, my lord! And the first of men is looking with an raptured soul upon the last, best work of an all-wise God, a beautiful Woman. End of chapter 38. Adam and Eve. Recording by Cornel Nemesh in Reno, Nevada. Chapter 39 of the Complete Works of Bran, the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Bran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Greg Giordano. Chapter 39 Working Fashions Fools Miss Sally H. is one of the very few society women who, aided by nothing but their beauty, wit, and talent, lift themselves into national prominence and attain something like fame. Miss H. has been for several seasons the acknowledged belle of New York and her position has not been disputed. She is a dark beauty, her features of classical purity, her profile very delicate, and her figure superb. She is a brilliant talker, and her talents are many and varied. Presumably, she has been the object of many masculine attentions, and the subject of many masculine quarrels. But she has kept her head and hand to herself, at least she has done so until a few weeks ago. Then the announcement of her engagement to Mr. Duncan E. was made public. She is to be married at Newport, September 15, and the wedding is to be as quiet an affair as possible. Mr. E. is a young New York businessman, good-looking and talented. He goes in for athletics. Chicago News the above slug of taffy was accompanied by a woodcut portrait of Miss H., which made her resemble a half-naked Indian squaw suffering with an acute attack of mully grubs, superinduced by an overfeed of baked dog. If Miss H.'s face does not hurt her for very homeliness, an email jury in the country would award her damages against the news in the sum of a million dollars and help her collect it with a shotgun. But those guileless innocents who imagine Miss H. entitled to sympathy are sadly mistaken. She, her fool friends, or relatives, paid a good round price for that puff, 
and fully expected that the artist as well as the penny a liner would indulge in a little fulsome flattery instead of turning state's evidence and convicting his co-laborer of perjury nearly every metropolitan daily is now engaged in this nauseous puffery business and the infection is rapidly spreading to the illustrated weeklies and magazines no wonder that foreigners have much to say about our bad manners worse taste lack of refinement and offensive loudness when the leading society ladies of the land will pay big prices to have themselves written up like variety actresses or prize cattle when they will pay to have their portraits paraded in the public prints and their personal charms proclaimed much as auctioneers and antebellum days expatiated upon the physical perfection of slaves put upon the block when they will beg the attention of the world and pour into its unwilling ear an exaggerated tale of their love affairs not omitting the suggestion that certain silly masculine inanities have fought for their favors the present nauseating puffery of society bells has grown out of the unpardonable bad taste not to say presumptuous insolence which the american press has ever displayed in dealing with the fair sex first it was the accomplished or the vivacious miss so-and-so that caught every woman likes to be thought accomplished or interesting just as every man delights to see himself paraded in the papers as a public-spirited citizen then the press grew bolder and introduced the adjectives charming fascinating beautiful etc that took still better the next step was the write-up in extenso next the portrait thus in a ratio of geometrical progression the bad habit has grown from the daring but courtly compliment to its present disguising proportions and the vanity and folly of their fair followers of fashion have grown with it what will be its ultimate development where will the rivalry of enterprising journals their determination to outdo each other in fulsome flattery of female fools who have money to pay for it finally land them already they are freely commenting upon the form and features of the fair sex what can they do next but go into particulars and inform us how much their patron measures around the bust they have already told us of the snowy whiteness of her bosom the actual size of the tiny little foot as sworn to by the bootmaker and how many inches of elastic it requires to make her garter when this becomes commonplace perhaps it will be necessary in order to command attention to publish portraits of their patrons posing as venuses eves hebs etc in purus naturalibus it is not strange that a man will pay newspapers to say publicly about his wife or daughter things that he would knock his best friend down for saying to him privately that he will deliberately set every scurrilous tongue wagging about the woman he loves and professes to honor cause her form and features to be discussed in every dive should one of our american women overhear a male acquaintance commenting on the whiteness of her bosom the size of her foot the shape of her waist and the latent passion in her dark eyes she would want him horsewhipped or shot yet she will pay a rank stranger a dollar a line to say these things in the public prints verily tis a strange world and sadly in need of a few more industrious fool killers end of chapter thirty nine working fashions fools recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter forty of the complete works of brand the iconoclast volume one by william cowper bran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. chapter forty the public pedagogue 
making wise men by machinery. If I might presume to tender a few words of advice to so high and mighty a personage as the President of the University of Texas, I should recommend that he carefully study the Solomonic proverb, quote, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding, end quote. In other words, never pull your trigger until you're sure you're loaded. For while a fizzle causes the unskillful to laugh, it cannot but make the judicious grieve. Every man capable of tracing effects to their efficient causes, who chanced to hear or read President George T. Winston's address, before the Association of Superintendents and Principals of Public Schools must have sighed in bitterness of soul, poor old Texas. These gentlemen, assembled for the ostensible purpose of enhancing their proficiency by the interchange of ideas, had a right to expect valuable instruction from the lips of a man who occupies the post of honor in the chief educational institute of the state, but were regaled with a cataclysm of misinformation, precipitated from an amorphous mind which seemed to be a compromise between Milton's unimaginable chaos and that land of darkness as darkness itself and where the light was as darkness. That such an address could proceed from the president of a state university is most remarkable. That it should be received as an oracle by the men at whose feet sit the youth of Texas is simply astounding. I read the address in no unfriendly or hypercritic spirit, for none rejoice more than I in whatsoever contributes, even a little, to the luster of the Lone Star. Every laurel won by Texas in the forum or the field is worn by all her citizens. Her every failure in the arena of the world is shame to all her sons. President Winston evidently appreciated the importance of the occasion but was unable to rise to it. Instead of an address at once philosophic and practical, conveying to his auditors a clear concept of duty and the best method of discharging it, he indulged in a rambling country lyceum discourse wherein worthless conclusions were drawn by main strength and awkwardness from false premises, interlarded with glaring misstatements and seasoned with anglomaniacal slop. It is not pleasant to think of hundreds of bright young minds being molded by a man who is a living vindication of Sheridan, long accused of libeling nature in his character of Mrs. Malaprop. What, says Pope, must be the priest when the monkey is a god. And what, the taxpayers of Texas well may ask, must be the day drudges of an educational system wherein a Winston occupies the post of honor. Where Texas found the party whom she has made president of her boasted university, I cannot imagine. But he talks like an anglicized Yankee one of those fellows who try to conceal the cerulean hue of their equators by wearing the British flag for a belly band. It is but mournful consolation to reflect that the chiefs of pretentious educational institutes elsewhere have proven by their parroting that they have as little conception of the social contract and true position of the pedagogue in the scheme of things, as has our own varsity president. 
Texas educational system is probably up to the average, and President Winston, as wise as many other pompous gerund grinders, who look into leather spectacles and see nothing, yet imagine that, like the adventurer in the Arabian tale, they are gazing upon all the wealth of the world. But that is no reason why we should continue to waste the public revenue on legato professors who would extract sunbeams from cucumbers and calcine ice into gunpowder. While nothing short of a perusal of the complete text of the oration in question can give an adequate idea of how much folly a varsity president can pump through his face in a given period, its salient features can be summed up in a brief paragraph. Quote, the schoolmaster represents the two greatest factors in modern progress, education and organization. These two factors are really one for education is a means to organization. Power unorganized is no longer power. Organization means strength and progress. Individualism means weakness and decay. The English people have risen by organized effort to the mastery of the globe. They have created the cheapest and most efficient government combining in the highest degree individual liberty and national power. They have created the greatest store of things contributing to the welfare, happiness, and refinement of humanity, and in education, literature, science, and art, have lifted humanity upon the highest plane of civilization." The Irish race is deficient in the faculty of organization and will be crushed out with the Indian and Negro by the more highly organized races. Football requires better organization than do other games, a higher order of intellect, hence its popularity with the people. The best universities may be expected to furnish the best football teams. The superior organization of the North enabled it to surpass the South in peace and crush it in war. The public school teacher, being the chief factor in organization, to him must be given the credit for the quick recovery of the South from the ravages of civil war. He is the chief power in things material as well as in matters intellectual. He alone can introduce new systems of thought and action in any province of human endeavor. End quote. Having thus sained President Winston's rhetorical sea, let us examine our catch and determine what is valuable food and what mere jellyfish that the schoolmaster is a very important factor in the social system, there can be no question. Let him have all the honor to which he is entitled, but let him not seek to appropriate that which belongs to others. The pedagogue is not the fount of wisdom. He is but the pipe, of large or small caliber as the case may be, through which the wisdom of others flows to fertilize the intellectual fields. How much, prithee, have all the public pedagogues of America, including the president of the Texas Varsity, added to the world's stock of wisdom during the last decade? Does it begin to dawn upon President Winston that there is another very important factor in the world's progress? namely the Newtons, Bacons, Copernics, Watts, Edisons, Shakespeare's, Burke's, Kepler's, Plato's, Jefferson's, and others, who, by patient research or the outpourings of super-gifted minds, have furnished forth the pedagogue's stock-in-trade. Science and art, 
philosophy and religion all that contributes to man's welfare material or spiritual originated in obscure closets and caves in the open fields beneath the star-domed vault of night and during all these ages have received chief furtherance from individual genius or application the schools but recording the progress made spreading abroad more or less skillfully the sacred fire wrested from heaven by intellectual titans still the pedagogue may well be proud of his profession for it is a privilege to think or even think at the thoughts of men of genius to officiate as their messengers to mankind let these royal heralds flourish their birch rods in every bypath cry the king and thereby get much honor winston says that education and organization are really the same because one is a means to the other how that may be i know not an avowal of love is usually a means to a baby still it were a work of supererogation to put diapers on a proposal of marriage organization is ever education of a certain sort but education is not always organization many of the world's wisest have stood like byron among men but not of them in a shroud of thoughts which were not their thoughts oxen organized in teams may accomplish more than working single but you cannot yoke pegasus and a plough horse bellerophon's winged mount peremptorily refuses to be organized and turn rectilinear furrows but plunges through time and space in an orbit of its own making often mistaken by the patient organizers for a lawless comet its appearance a dire portent you cannot drive shakespeare and charles hoyt in double harness nor make the mockbird and nighthawk sing in harmony the public pedagogue does not go out every morning before breakfast and with ferula for archimedean lever and three r's for fulcrum prize open the gates of day the organization of infants of every conceivable degree of intellectuality into classes and their formal elevation through successive grades by means of cunningly devised educational jack-screws or block and tackle does not constitute the complete dynamics of the universe president winston to the contrary notwithstanding knowledge must exist somewhere before there be any pedagogue to impart it and though under the name of truth it hide in emir's well those whose souls are athirst therefore will assuredly find it though denied all mechanical furtherance education is simply the acquirement of useful information it matters not how nor where nor when deprive any man even a varsity president of all knowledge but that obtained in the schools and he were helpless as an infant abandoned in mid-ocean he could not so much as distinguish between peas and beans between dogs and wolves by the descriptions furnished by naturalists that man who has lived to learn wisely and well has reached the ultima thule of terrestrial knowledge the ne plus ultra of human understanding more can no college professor or varsity president impart if he know not this he is uneducated though he be graduate of every university from salamanca to the sorbonne and from oxford to austin 
organization connotes mutual interdependence of the component parts limitation of individualism the circumscription of personal liberty to a certain extent this is advantageous to man without it civilization human progress were impossible but to draw a line between wise use and abuse were a task of some difficulty president winston assures us that the british government is the best in the world yet it is a chaos compared to the organization of the russian autocracy because we find beneficial that organization which makes cooperation possible would he carry it to the extent of communism because concentration of capital reduces cost of production does he approve of that organization which enables trusts to juggle prices when organization has reached that point where one-third of our wealth producers must stand idle because denied the privilege of producing the wherewithal to feed and clothe and house themselves it might be well for varsity presidents to apply the soft pedal to their paean of praise and inquire diligently whether it be possible to get entirely too much of a good thing too many accept st paul's concession of a little wine for the stomach's sake for license to become sots thomas carlyle who could see almost as far into a millstone as the average varsity president was of the opinion that the tendency to ever more compact organization was transforming both education and religion into farces blighting the spiritual and intellectual life of man and precipitating in the world of industry the most important and complex question with which political economists had ever been called upon to deal that was nearly seventy years ago when vast organization of capital had just begun when the age of machinery both for the grinding of corn and the inculcation of knowledge was but nascent hear him growl Quote, though mechanism wisely contrived has done much for man we cannot be persuaded that it has ever been the chief source of his worth or happiness we have machines for education instruction that mysterious communing of wisdom and ignorance is no longer an indefinable tentative process requiring a study of individual aptitude and a perpetual variation of means and methods to attain the same end but a secure universal straightforward business to be conducted in the gross by proper mechanism with such intellect as comes to hand philosophy science art literature all depend on machinery no newton by silent meditation now discovers the system of the world by the falling of an apple but some quite other than newton stands in his museum his scientific institution and behind whole batteries of retorts digesters and galvanic piles imperatively interrogates nature who however shows no haste to answer in defect of raphael's and angelo's and mozart's we have royal academies of painting sculpture music whereby the languishing spirit of art may be strengthened by the more generous diet of a public kitchen hence the royal and imperial societies the bibliotechs glyptotechs technotechs which front us in all capital cities like so many well-finished hives to which it is expected the stray agencies of wisdom will swarm of their own accord and hive 
and make honey men have grown mechanical in head and heart as well as in hand they have lost faith in individual endeavor and in natural force of any kind not for internal perfection but for external combination and arrangement for institutions constitutions for mechanism of one sort or another do they hope and struggle science and art have derived only partial help from the culture or manuring of institutions often have suffered damage End quote. of course carlyle may have been mistaken still the fact that since he uttered his warning the world has not produced one man of genius except in the department of mechanics that intellectually the last half of the present century is to the first half as moonlight unto sunlight and as water unto wine that religion is becoming even more materialistic patriotism passing and poetry dying or already dead that millionaires are multiplying while the legion of idle labor grows larger suggests that important inferences may be drawn from this ever-increasing organization of powers spiritual and material and like quintius fixlian i invite the reader to draw them if the english race be indeed rising to the mastery of the globe there is no cause for immediate alarm for at his present rate of progress it will be some ages yet before john bull succeeds in stealing it all nations like individuals have their youth their lusty manhood and their decline and there is every indication that britain has passed the meridian of her power while russia and america her equals in the arena of the world still find their shadows falling toward the west persia assyria rome and spain have aspired to the lordship of the world and each in turn has been brought low by that insidious power that for a century has been draining the iron from the blood of england the love of luxury the subjection of glory to greed if history be philosophy teaching by example the lion of britain is senescent if not already dead and stuffed with sawdust but let the world look well to that savage brute known as the russian bear no england is not master of the globe nor can she ever be for her home territory is trifling and distant provinces are a source of weakness in war it were idle to discuss with a confirmed anglomaniac the respective merits of the british and american governments it may be that the former is cheapest despite the maintenance of an established church a great army and navy and a sovereign who with her worthless spawn cost the taxpayers three million one hundred forty five thousand dollars per annum while our president requires less than one sixtieth of that sum england does not pension the adult orphan children of men who sprain their moral character in an effort to dodge the draft nor does queen victoria sell government bonds to banker syndicates on private bids hence i will have no controversy with the learned theban on the question of economy the british subject may enjoy greater individual liberty than does the american sovereign for aught i am prepared to prove true he is taxed to support a church founded by that eminent christian apostle henry the eighth 
and whose next fide defensor will be the present worshipful prince of wales is represented in but one branch of parliament and has no voice in the selection of his chief executive officer if the sovereign and hereditary house of lords refuse to do his bidding he must grin and bear it while we can turn the rascals out even if we turn a more disreputable crew of chronic gab traps and industrial cutthroats in he enjoys one privilege which is denied us much to the dissatisfaction of our anglomaniacs that of purchasing titles of nobility but we can acquire a life tenure of the title of judge by arbitrating a horse trade or officiating one term as justice of the peace while by assiduous bootlicking we may like rienzi miltiades johnsing obtain a lieutenant colonelcy or even a gigadier brindleship on the gilded staff of some two-by-four governor and disport in all the glorious pomp and circumstance of war at inaugural balls or on mimic battlefields hence honors are easy that the irish race is deficient in the organizing faculty is a great discovery and i would advise president winston to apply for a patent john bull will prove himself ungrateful indeed if he neglects to pension him for having demonstrated that those irish organizations which for half a century have kept his public servants looking under their beds o nights for things neither ornamental nor useful were mere fata morganas brocken spectres or disease of the imagination winston has evidently been misled by a more than boeotian ignorance blithely footing it hand in hand with a vivid anti-celtic imagination he does not know that ireland was the seat of learning and the expounder of law both human and divine when the rest of europe was a wide weltering chaos in which shrieked the demons ignorance and disorder he was oblivious of the fact that the american people the master organizers of the age are far more irish than english you can scarce scratch an american babe of the third generation without drawing celtic blood strange that the only federal regiment which did not go to pieces at the battle of bull run though occupying the hottest part of the field was composed of these very irishmen who are incapable of organization mcclellan the greatest military organizer of modern times though by no means the ablest commander was of celtic extraction as was the duke of wellington as are the men at the head of the british and american armies to-day were president winston better informed he would not talk so glibly of what the english race has done for literature no englishman of pure anglo-saxon or anglo-saxon norman lineage has ever reached the front rank in the great republic of letters in art and science in oratory and music even in war and commerce they have had to content themselves with walking well to the rear of the bandwagon shakespeare was of welsh descent but whether of celtic or cambric stock it were difficult to determine the cimbri and celts are both very ancient races a remnant of the former is found in wales while the survivors of the latter are the irish and scotch highlanders 
northern france and wales have strong celtic contingents byron rare ben johnson christopher north oliver goldsmith dean swift lawrence stern and lewis stevenson were celts by blood scott burns carlyle and macaulay were scots of celtic extraction tom moore brinsley sheridan and edmund burke were irishmen as are balf and sullivan the musical composers disraeli was a jew the genealogy of pope and tennyson remain to be traced that the original duke of marlborough was an englishman by birth and breeding goes without saying he acted like one no celtic commander could have robbed his dead soldiers in the province of belle lettres john bull can at least claim alfred austin his present poet laureate and oscar wilde the dramatic decadent dr jameson is england's military lion and president george t winston of the texas varsity her representative of learning the english proper are but a nation of shopkeepers and the greatest shops are not conducted by anglo-saxons england's great manufacturers are scots her merchant princes are irishmen her leading bankers are jews and her reigning family an indifferent breed of low dutch the romans overran england but unable to subjugate either scotland or ireland abandoned perfidious albion as a worthless conquest everybody took a turn at robbing it whenever it had anything worth carrying off until the norman buccaneers appropriated it bodily and reduced the saxons to serfdom by amalgamation with the inferior race they produced the tudors who gave them Ansem Mary and a virgin parenthetical question mark queen then the scotch stuarts took a turn at ruling and robbing england and were followed by the religious bigots and witch burners the french ruled it a while through their puppets and were succeeded by the dutch who held it in such contempt that they would not permit its language to be spoken at court they are still milking it for more than three millions per annum with an extra pull at the udder whenever one of the seventy odd descendants of the sovereign concludes to found a family the scotch the welsh and dutch enabled england to enslave and plunder ireland and upon this meat john bull the j caesar of pawnbrokers is growing great i much fear that president winston studied sports under the tuition of referee erp else he could have scarce given a decision to the favorite of the college campus football requires neither the intellect nor the perfect organization which is a sine qua non to success in our great national game its chief requisites are long hair leathery lungs and abnormally developed legs the game owes its popularity to the average boy's predilection for the brutal his inherent animalism football has for ages been a favorite game with savages while baseball is a product of civilization i am not decrying football i incline to the view that an occasional rough-and-tumble scrapping match in which there is imminent danger of black eyes and even of broken bones is good for a boy i simply point out that as an intellectual game 
it not only ranks far below chess billiards and baseball but does not rise to a parody with pugilism it is a mistake to assume that an intellectual divertisement must be popular with an intellectual people the highest culture is but a film cast over a fathomless sea of savagery the most learned of the greeks the most cultured of the romans gloried in brutal games and today a dog fight a slugging match or even a college football game is relished by the titan of intellect as keenly as by the bowery tough i cannot imagine where president winston absorbed the idea that lack of organization has been the curse of the south it may surprise him to be told that in antebellum days it was not only the chief repository of culture but possessed a fair proportion of the nation's wealth the south has ever been chiefly an agricultural country and will so remain despite the frantic efforts of enthusiasts to subvert natural laws not until the resources of our soil are in great measure exhausted or increase of population forces people from the fields can the south become a great manufacturing country such is the lesson of history which we can only ignore to our loss wealth accumulates at large manufacturing and trade centers as it cannot elsewhere and naturally seeks to further its interest by organization the concentration of forces intellectual and industrial on that stupendous scale which has won president winston's admiration is a post-bellum development both north and south the greatest of american organizers have been southern men washington and jefferson were types of the individualism which is supposed to have been our bane yet one organized the continental army which won our independence the other organized the federal government it is not true that the southern confederacy was crushed by superior organization better disciplined troops than the veterans of lee and jackson never faced a battery hardy's tactics one of the most highly esteemed of military manuals was the work of a confederate general the assault on the heights of gettysburg has become historic as much because of the wonderful organization displayed by the confederate troops as because it marked the supreme hour of a nation's agony it was the only time in the history of this world when an assaulting column was greeted with cheers of admiration by the soldiers who stood to receive the shock that fact alone should suffice to make an american college president proud of his country should purge him of every atribularious taint of anglomaniacism only once have the sons of men in any age or clime displayed a grander heroism than did those who hurled themselves against the heights of gettysburg and that when the federals silenced their guns to cheer the dauntless courage of their foe it is not my present purpose to refight the civil war and trace every effect to its efficient cause i have simply undertaken to make good my original proposition that president winston is as thersites says of patroclus a fool positive and should therefore hold his peace the school teacher has doubtless played no unimportant part in the rehabilitation of the south but he should not set up as autocrat of the universe 
on a salary of forty dollars a month and burden the ass's bridge with the idea that he maketh all things and without him was nothing made that is made his ferula may be an aaron's rod which buds and blossoms but it does not bear sufficient fruit to furnish a hungry world with necessary aliment we still crave manna from heaven and grapes from hebron the public pedagogue does not make the laws of trade his province is to interpret them and proud may he be of his labor if his protégés do not find it necessary to forget at the very gateway of a commercial career that he ever had a name and habitation on the earth nor does he frequently alarm the plodding natives by the introduction of new systems of thought and action such systems do not spring completely panoplied from the cerebrum of our educational jove and stand about on one foot like a lost goose or country lad awaiting an introduction new systems of thought and action are usually the growth of ages the seed often sown by men we hear not of when of such sudden development that they require a formal introduction they are apt to be received with the scant courtesy of a poor relation the introducer reviled as a crank or condemned as a heretic and crucified generally speaking the professional educator confines himself pretty closely to his birch and his textbooks being quite content to propagate as best he may the ideas of others neither the birch nor the textbook it may be well to remark constitutes the world's stock of wisdom but only an incidental furtherance thereto the key as it were by which the treasure is more readily come at when the schoolmaster has put his pupil in possession of the open sesame he considers his duty done that he has earned his provender and perhaps he has in this day and age it is all that is expected of him all that he is paid for he is not required to inculcate wisdom which is well for that can no man do he is not even expected to impart much knowledge but to put his pupil through a course of mental calisthenics miscalled education but even this is by no means to be despised with mind strengthened by exercise even in a desert and lungs developed by football the youth may be able to delve the harder for knowledge when happily released from the gerund grinder to pray the more lustily to the immortal gods for understanding which transmutes what were else base metal into ingots of fine gold there was a time when more was expected of a teacher but that was before the application of labor-saving machinery to spiritual matters before colleges became known as places where coals are brightened and diamonds are dimmed before it became customary to cast potential homers and hannibals topsies and blind toms into the same educational hopper and hire some gabby holofernes from god knows where to manipulate the mill it was a time when men considered qualified to teach declined to waste effort on numbskulls no matter whose brats they might be it was a time when the fame of a great the honor of a good 
and the infamy of a bad man were shared by their preceptors. Those were the days of individualism which President Winston so much deplores, the era which fashioned those men whom the world for twenty centuries has been proud to hail as masters. As the doctors have decided that all human frailties are but diseases, I do not despair of our varsity president. Some Theodorus may yet arise to purge him canonically with Antiquian hellebore, and thus clear out the perverse habit of his brain, and make him a man of as goodly sense as the rejuvenated Gargantua. End of chapter 40 The Public Pedagogue Chapter 41 of The Complete Works of Bran the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Bran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Josh Kibbe. Chapter 41 Puffery of the Press. The able editor is perhaps the only quack doctor extant who greedily swallows his own medicine and foolishly imagines that it does him good. Puffery is the able editor's invariable prescription, no matter whether the patient be a moss-grown town, a broken-down political roué, the victim of early indiscretions, or a cheap John merchant suffering the first paroxysms of financial dissolution. Although he knows how his medicine is made, knows that it is a nauseous compound of rank hypocrisy and brazen mendacity, he actually believes that, if taken in liberal doses, is potent to cure commercial paralysis or put new life into a political corpse. When the first experiment fails to prove satisfactory, instead of changing the treatment, he doubles the dose. One would suppose that, like most Cagliostros, who pick up a precarious livelihood by pumping the bellies of their betters full of the east wind, the able editor would laugh in his sleeves at his dupes. But not so. He is more earnest than the legato doctor, described by Gulliver, who had discovered a shortcut for the cure of colic, as little discouraged when a patient bursts under the somewhat peculiar treatment. So greedy is he for his own medicine, so fond of working the bellows for the expansion of his own bowels, that he can scarce find time to attend to his patients. Pick up any newspaper, big or little, Great Daily, with fake voting contest annex, or Country Weekly shot full of ads of city swindling concerns, and note what the able editor thinks of himself. How he twists and turns to find some pretext for parading his own transcendent greatness. See how he greedily seizes upon every little chunk of taffy, and rolls it as a sweet morsel under his tongue. How he places in his cap every foolish feather which the idle wind of puffery wafts within his clutch, and then struts in the face of heaven, a sight to provoke the contempt of men, the pity of the gods. Let the Boomerville Broadaxe but intimate that the Bungtown Boomer knows a thing or two, and forthwith the latter transfers the saccharine slug to its own columns, and perchance points to it with pride, bids the Bungtown world behold what the world of Boomerville thinks of it. Then the Bungtown Boomer intimates that the Boomerville Broadaxe likewise knows a thing or two, and the latter which has been eagerly watching for this Roland Forts Oliver, swoops hungrily down upon this delectable morsel, and cries, Ha ha! It has obtained a value received, has tickled, and been tickled in return. Then the editors of these two great public educators begin a cross-fire of sugar-plums, much to the edification of the world and their own mutual satisfaction. What would we think of that lawyer, doctor, or merchant, who went about assiduously proclaiming, with sound of trumpet, what his fellow said about him. Would we not vote him a fool? At best a conceited prig, lacking in taste and good manners? Commendation is sweet to all, but it is just as permissible for a bell to boast her conquests in the ballroom, the lawyer to inform judge and jury what his fellow disciples of Blackstone think of him, the scholars to parade his erudition or the merchant his integrity, as for an editor to reproduce in his own paper fulsome compliments paid him for no other purpose under heaven than to get a puff in return. 
End of chapter 41. Puffery of the Press. Chapter 42 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by William Jones. Chapter 42 The Bike Bacillus. The Woman's Rescue League met recently at Washington and launched a double-shotted anathema at the female bike fiend. The leaguers attributed to the bicycle craze the alarming increase in the number of courtesans and call upon ministers and respectable women everywhere to denounce cycling by the sex as vulgar and indecent. Nor do they stop there. The bike, in their opinion, is irremediably bad. While destroying the morals of the maid, it wrecks the prospective motherhood of the matron. It is provocative of diseases peculiar to women, and calculated to transform the sex into a grand army of invalids. These are a few of the reasons why the Women's Rescue League is scattering tacks in the pathway of the pneumatic tire. There are others. Those whose specialty is the conservation of virtue should carefully study the causation of vice. In dealing with a red-light district, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. To remove the causes which produces courtesans were a nobler work than to drag debased womanhood out of the depths. Doubtless the rescuers imagine they have made a new discovery of inestimable benefit to society, have laid the axe to the root of that evil of which the body house is the flower and hell the fruitage. After patient research in the science of sexual criminology, they have determined that the bicycle is naughty without being nice. It is perversity personified. It is the incarnation of cussedness, the avatar of evil. Turn it which way you will, it rolls into the primrose path of dalliance, whose objective point is the acaldama. No more do women's feet take hold in hell. She goes scorching over the brink with her tootsies on the handlebar. So say the ladies of the Rescue League. What are we going to do about it? Clearly, it were useless to denounce a craze, sheer folly to argue against a fad. We had better save our breath to cool our broth. The ministers cannot be depended upon to lend their moral support to this new movement against the Magdalene Maker. They have bought bikes, and are chasing the girl in bloomers. One half, the great she-worlds on wheels, the other wondering how it feels to ride clothespin fashion. Clearly, the Women's Rescue League cannot stem the tide, not even with the help of the iconoclast and ex-Governor Hogg. It must either straddle a bike or join in the stampede, climb a fence or get run over. Heavens! Is there no help for us, no halting place this side of heterism? Are we all peddling at breakneck pace to the grove of Daphne where lust is law? Is the bike transforming this staid old world into one wild bacchic orgy or phallic revel? Have we toiled afoot thus far up the social mountainside only to go bowling down on a pneumatic tire as low as to the fiends? Help us, somebody. Police! Just why the bicycle affects woman so unfavorably, the leaguers do not inform us. We are left to surmise why tramping a bike should make her more reckless than treading a sewing machine, why exercise in the open air should be more deleterious to health and morals than the round dance in a heated ballroom, or even the delightfully dangerous back parlor hug. Why segregation on the cycle should be more potent to evoke those passions which make for perdition than the narrow-seated buggy, with its surreptitious pressure of limb to limb, and the moral euthanasia which the man of the world knows so well how to distill into the ear of womanhood. 
why the bike should be more dangerous to morals than the french fiddle mentioned by shakespeare appears to be a question solely within the province of the pathologist a pantagruelism is proceeding almost exclusively on micrological lines we may expect that sooner or later some eminent physician will startle the world by discovering the bicycle bacillus all our ills appear to be caused by minute insects that get inside of us demoralize our system of government and inaugurate a reign of anarchy everything from mugwumpery to the meddler's itch from corns to crime is now traced to the pernicious activity of some microbian even our currency system is blasted by gold bugs and prohibition milk sickness is being treated with vermifuge a kansas m d has succeeded in hiving the old age microbe and is now treating the ballet girls whom weiss and greenwall and rigsby and walter will bring south next winter while a new york empiric has discovered the insanity insect and is fumigating the brain of the reverend mr parkhurst thus does medical science go marching from conquest to conquest reforming and rejuvenating this wicked and suffering world clearly the rescue league should have cried for aid to the doctors of medicine instead of to the doctors of divinity if the bicycle bacillus can be caught and killed the red light district will disappear and the rescuers turn their wonderful energies in new directions once the existence of this nymphomanium micrococus as we philomaths would call it is established the rest will be dead easy whether patients will be treated externally or internally depends of course upon the habits of the infinitesimal vulture that is feeding on our social vitals we do not know as yet whether it is a moral microbe or a physical phylloxera if the former the mind will have to be taken out, sandpapered, carefully rinsed in a strong aseptic solution, and treated with soothing and aphrodisiacs after each meet of the bicycle brigade. If the latter, the evil can easily be obviated by providing the softer sex with medicated cycling suits, or half-soling their bloomers with asbestos. If the rescuers really have the good of their frail sisters at heart, they should cooperate with the physician, should provide themselves with compound microscopes and search assiduously for bacilli, instead of appealing to preachers who may themselves be veritable breeding grounds for the most destructive of all bacteria. It may be necessary, in order to compel success, for the rescuers to sacrifice themselves upon the altar of science, to become martyrs to the cause in striving to save others from the pestilence that walketh in darkness they may be themselves destroyed but the true reformer draws back from no danger let them take their lives in their hands if need be boldly seize the bicycle bacillus by the ears and bump his head the crisis is indeed acute still we may rely on science to save us it is possible that the first step in that direction has been already taken for is not the insanity germ discovered by the new york doctor responsible for the bicycle craze as well as the reform frenzy and if a free silver lunatic or gold bug crank can be permanently cured by the simple expedient of boring a hole in his lumbar region and drawing off the cerebral spinal fluid and in it the microbes that build wheels in his head is there not hope that the bicycle habit may be altogether abolished by the return of the fiends to mental normality now that dr babcock has learned to cast out devils will not the world be redeemed cert let the woman's rescue league take courage and bask in the sunny optimism of the iconoclast We'll soon have all the various brands of bacteria in the bouillon. Then there'll be nobody to rescue, nothing to reform, and the leaguers and the public can take a much-needed rest. 
In all seriousness, I opine that the bike is a harmless instrument when properly handled. The trouble is not so much with the evasive machine as with the woman who straddles it. It will carry its rider to church as rapidly as to the reservation. Doubtless many women employ it to seek opportunities for evil as a means of attracting the attention of libidinous men. But had the bike never been built, they would find some other way into the path of sin, would get there just the same. There were courtesans before it came. There will be de Mimondanes ages after its departure. Mary Magdalene either walked or rode a mule. Aspasia was a scourger, but she couldn't coast. Helen of Troy never saw a pneumatic tire. Semiramis preferred a side saddle. Cleopatra didn't attract Colonel Anthony's attention by mounting a machine in the marketplace. The bike is no more an incentive to Baudry than is a wheelbarrow. It doesn't make a woman depraved. It only renders her ridiculous. End of chapter 42 The Bike Bacillus Chapter 43 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Jim Gallagher. Chapter 43 Evidences of Man's Immortality Unless you accept the testimony of the Bible as conclusive, what evidence have you of God's existence and man's immortality? Gladstone The same evidence that we would have of the existence of the ocean were one drop of water withdrawn, of the life of a forest if a single leaf were to fall. The Bible did not create man's belief in God's existence and his own immortality, but of this belief old as Zoroaster antedating Babylon is the Bible born. It is simply an outward evidence of man's inward grace. I do accept the testimony of the Bible, but only as one of a cloud of witnesses. In questions of such grave import, we cannot have too much evidence. Hence, it is strange indeed that anyone should make the Bible the sole foundation of his faith, should take his stand upon an infinitesimal portion of what the world knew in ages past. The Bible is but one of many sacred books in which man has borne witness that he is the favored creature of an almighty being, but one voice and a multitude singing hosannas to the Most High, a single note in the mighty diapason of the universe. A hundred men are shipwrecked upon an island in the Arctic Ocean. By day and night they dream of absent friends, of mother, wife, and child, the pleasant meadows or the sunny hills of their distant homes. Hourly they scan the horizon with eager eyes. Daily they ask each other, Is there hope? All former animosities are forgotten, for they are brothers in misfortune. One declares that the island lies in the pathway of a regular line of steamers, and that they must soon be rescued. This view is approved by many, and their hearts beat high with hope. Their sufferings are borne with cheerfulness, their hardships appear trivial, for their probation is soon to pass, and they will be at home. Another averes that they are too far north to be reached by the ocean liners, but that a whaler will soon be due in that vicinity, and all will be well. This view is approved by some, and thus there are two parties confidently expecting succor, but from different sources. A third studies the map, notes the advanced season, inspects the food supply, and shakes his head. We shall be lost, he says, Desire has misled your judgment. You do but dream. Do the two parties then entertain hope strive, each to disprove the theory of the other, and unite in persecuting the dissenter? No, they reason together, each anxious to ascertain the truth, knowing that it will profit him nothing to believe a lie. Suddenly a cry is heard, A sail! Do those who put their trust in the whaler turn their backs to the sea and say, O H blank! L. That's only one of those regular steamship heretics. No rag of canvas will he discover. Do those who were destitute of hope decline to look? No. 
all rushed to the shore and strained their eyes to penetrate the mist, little caring whether it be whaler or steamer, so they do but see a ship. When one makes out the vessel, he is not content until the eyes of others confirm his vision, and all look not with the jealous hope that he may be wrong, but with an earnest prayer that he may be right. That island is this little earth, its shipwrecked mariners all sons of men. Yet how different we set about determining whether, from out the everlasting sea that encircles us, there comes indeed a ship of Zion to succor and to save. What one man believes or disbelieves is a matter of little moment, for belief will not put gods on high Olympus, nor unbelief extinguish the fires of hell. Man can neither create nor uncreate the actual by a mental emanation. If deity exists, you would continue to exist did a universe deny him. If he exists not, then all the faith and prayers and sacrifices of a thousand centuries will not evolve him from the night of nothingness. There is, or there is not, a life beyond the grave, regardless of the denial of every atheist and the affirmation of every prophet. Then what boots it whether we believe or disbelieve in God's existence or man's immortality? Nothing in so far as it concerns the factual, much in that upon our hopes and fears is based our terrestrial bane or blessing. Banish all belief in God, eliminate the idea of man's responsibility to a higher power, make him the sole lord of his life and earthly good, his greatest garden, and you destroy the dynamics of progress, the genius of civilization. Man has a tendency to become what he believes himself to be. Consciously or unconsciously, he strives with less or greater strength toward his ideal. Hence, it is all important that he consider himself an immortal rather than the pitiful sport of time and space, a child of omniscience rather than the ephemeral emanation of unclean ooze. Had man always considered himself simply an animal, his tendencies would have been ever earthward. Believing himself half divine, he is striven to mount above the stars. True, many great men have been atheists, but they were formed by ancestry and environment permeated by worship of divine power. Without a belief in his own semi-divinity to lead the race onward and upward, the conditions which produced a Voltaire or Ingersoll were impossible. Civilization is further advanced than ever before, and atheism more general. But those who employed this fact as argument against religious faith forget that a body thrown upward will continue to ascend for a time after it is parted from the propelling power. Atheism is no wise responsible for human progress, for atheism is nothing, a mere negation, and out of nothing, nothing comes. A belief in God affords man a basis upon which to build. It is an acknowledgment of authority, the chief prerequisite of order. But in atheism there is no constructive element. While it may be no more immoral to deny the existence of deity than to question the wondrous tale of Troy, History teaches that, considered from a purely utilitarian standpoint, the most absurd faith is better for a nation than none, that the civic virtues do not long survive the sacrifice, that when a people desert their altars, their glory soon decay. The civilization of the world has been, time and again, imperiled by the spirit of denial. When Rome began to mock her gods, she found the barbarians thundering at her gates. When France insulted her priesthood and crowned a Cortesian as goddess of reason in Notre Dame, Paris was a maelstrom in the nation, a chaos in which murder raged and discord shrieked. Today we are boasting of our progress, but tis the onward march of Juggernaut, beneath whose iron wheels patriotism, honesty, purity, and the manly spirit of independence are crushed into the mire. We have drifted into an atheistical age, and its concomitants are selfishness, sensationalism, and sham. The old hardiness and healthiness have gone out of life, have been supplanted by the artificial. Everything is now show and seeming, leather and prunella. The body social become merely a galvanic machine or electric motor. In our grandsire's day, the great man helped the poor, and the poor man loved the great. Now the great man systematically despoils the poor, and the poor man regards the great with a feeling of envy and hatred akin to that of which the French Revolution was born. Character no longer counts for aught unless reinforced by a bank account. Men who have despoiled the widow of her might and the orphan of his patrimony 
are hailed with the acclaim due to conquering heroes. Our most successful books and periodicals would pollute a Parisian sewer or disgrace a Portuguese banyo. The suffrages of the people are bought and sold like sheep. The national policy is dictated by dives. Men are sent to Congress whom God intended for the gallows, while those he ticketed for the penitentiary spout inanities in fashionable pulpits. The merchant who pays his debts in full when he might settle for ten cents on the dollar is considered deficient in common sense. The grandsons of revolutionary soldiers, who consider themselves the equal of kings and the superior of princes, wear the livery of lackeys to obtain an easy living. Presidents save seven-figure fortunes on five-figure salaries and are applauded by people who profess to be respectable. Governors waste the public revenues in suppressing pugilistic enterprises begotten of their own encouragement, only to be re-elected by fools and slobbered over by Pharisees. Bradley Martin balls are given, while half a million better people go hungry to bed. Friendship has become a farce, the preface of fraud. Revolting crimes increase, and sexuality is tinged with infamy of the Orient. Men who were too proud to borrow leave sons who are not ashamed to beg. In man, great riches are preferable to a good name, and in woman, a silken gown covers a multitude of sins. The homely virtues of the old mothers of Israel are mocked, while strumpets fouler than sycorax are received in society boasting itself select. Why is this? It is because the old religious spirit is dormant, if not dead. It is because when people consider themselves but as the beasts that perish, they can make no spiritual progress, but imitate their supposed ancestors. Religion is becoming little more than a luxury, the temple a sumptuous palace wherein people, ennuied with themselves, may parade their costly clothes, have their jaded passions soothed by sensuous music, their greed for the bizarre satiated by sensational sermons. This being true, the question of evidence of God's existence and man's immortality becomes the most important ever propounded. The devout worshipper points to his sacred book, but we have had sacred books in abundance so far back as we can trace human history, yet the wave of atheism, of unbelief, rises ever higher and higher, threatens to engulf the world. After nearly nineteen centuries of earnest proselyting, Less than a third of the world has accepted Christianity, and in those countries professedly Christian, atheism flourishes as it does nowhere else. Of more than 70 million Americans, less than 24 million are church communicants, and it is doubtful if half of these really believe the Bible. Beecher criticized it almost as freely as does Ingersoll, while a number of prominent preachers of the Briggs-Abbott brand are even now explaining, in the pulpit and the press, that it is little more than a collection of myths. The people are drifting ever further from the book of books, and the pulpit appears ambitious to lead the procession. It is idle to urge that man should believe the Bible, for man should believe nothing, man can believe nothing but what receives the sanction of his reason. He is no more responsible for what he believes or disbelieves than for the color of his eyes or the place of birth. He may deceive the world with a false profession of faith, but can deceive neither God nor himself. The mind of even the worst of men is a court in which every cause is tried with rigid impartiality, with absolute honesty. A fool may mislead it, a child may convince it, but not even its possessor can coerce it. Hence, to command one to believe, without first providing him with a satisfactory basis for his faith, were an idle waste of breath. A man is no more blamable for doubting the existence of deity than for doubting aught else that may seem to him absurd. He doubts because the evidence submitted is unsatisfactory, or his mind is incapable of properly analyzing it. Probably none of the sacred books ever yet convinced an intelligent human being that there is aught in the universe greater than himself. I do not mean by this that the Bible and the Koran and the Zen Avesta and the Vedas are all false but there is lack of sufficient evidence that they are true. Those who accept them do so because they harmonize with their own half-conscious religious conceptions, because their truth is established by esoteric rather than by exoteric evidence. All attempts to supplant Buddhism and Mohammedanism by Christianity have proven futile, 
and that because the former do, while Christianity does not, voice the religious sentiment of the Orient, a sentiment which exists regardless of their sacred books, and of which the latter are but indications. You can no more demonstrate the truth of the Bible to a Hindu than you can demonstrate the truth of the Vedas to a Christian, for in either case outward evidence is wanting and the subject is not en rapport with the new doctrine. It is not infrequently urged that evidence sufficient to convince Mr. Gladstone should likewise convince Colonel Ingersoll, and so it doubtless would in a court of law. But in matters spiritual, what may appear confirmation strong as proofs of holy writ to the one may seem absurdity absolute to the other. Neither had the pleasure of Moses' acquaintance. All witnesses of his miracles have been dead so long that their very graves are forgotten. There is nothing in the accounts, however, violative of Mr. Gladstone's conception of deity, hence he finds no difficulty in accepting them. To Colonel Ingersoll, however, there is something ridiculous in the idea of the creator of the cosmos become a bonfire and holding a private confab with the stuttering Hebrew. He demands undisputable evidence, it is not forthcoming, and he brands the story as a fraud. For the same reason that Mr. Gladstone accepts the miracles of Moses, he accepts Christ as the Savior. For the same reason that he denies the burning bush, Colonel Ingersoll denies Christ's divinity. The story of a suffering Savior appeals directly to Mr. Gladstone's heart, but it gets no further than Colonel Ingersoll's head. The one tries it by his sympathies, the other by the rules of evidence that obtain in a court of law. In summing up, Colonel Ingersoll might say, it has not been demonstrated to the satisfaction of this court that Jesus ever claimed to be the only begotten Son of God. The testimony to the effect that he raised the dead, walked upon the waves, came forth from the grave, and ascended bodily into heaven appears to be all hearsay and by witnesses of unknown credibility. If we consider the impression made upon his contemporaries, we find that his miracles and resurrection failed to convince those best qualified to analyze evidence. He seems to have been regarded as nothing more than a popular religious reformer or schismatic. From the New Testament we learn that he did not found a new faith, but lived and died in that of his fathers, that it is impossible to follow the instructions of Jesus without becoming in religion a Jew. As he was the sixteenth Savior the world has crucified, his tragic death does not prove him divine. As immaculate conceptions were quite common among the Greeks and Romans, with whom both he and his immediate following came much in contact, I incline to the view that he entered the world in the good old way. Granting the correctness of such a conclusion, it does not necessarily follow that Jesus was not heaven-sent, or that he was in any way unworthy the love and veneration of the world. The proposition of the eloquent Father Brennan, that Jesus was either in very truth the only begotten Son of the Father, or an impious fraud deserving execration, is only tenable on the supposition that the language attributed to him by New Testament writers is properly authenticated. When we remember that the art of printing had not then been invented, that Christ wrote nothing himself, that the record of his life was probably not composed until he had been long dead, that the besetting sin of the East is exaggeration, that it was the custom of the Greeks, in whose language the New Testament was first written, to assign a heavenly origin to popular heroes, we must concede that there is some reason for doubt whether Jesus ever claimed to be other than the son of Joseph the carpenter, granting that his life and language are correctly reported, that he was indeed divinity. The fact remains that a vast majority of mankind declined to accept him as such, that while the church is striving with so little success to raise his standard in Paynim lands, atheism is striking its roots ever deeper into our own. The church should recognize the fact that no man is an atheist from choice. Deep in the heart of every human being is implanted a horror of annihilation. A man may become reconciled to the idea, just as he may become resigned to the necessity of being hanged, but he strives as desperately to escape the one as he does to avoid the other. Does the church owe any duty to the honest doubter further than the reiteration of a dogma which his reason rejects? When he asks for evidence of God's existence, Judaism points him to the miracles of Moses, Christianity to those of Jesus, 
Mohammedanism to the revelations of its prophet, and if he find these beyond his comprehension or violative of his reason, they dismiss him with a gentle reminder that the fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. He retorts by accusing of critics either of superstitious ignorance or rank dishonesty, so honors are easy. He is told that if he doesn't perform the impossible, work a miracle by altering the construction of his own mind, he will be damned, and it is touched up semi-occasionally by the pulpiteers as an emissary of the devil. Being thus put on the defensive, he undertakes to demonstrate that all revealed religions are a fraud deliberately perpetrated by the various priesthoods. He searches through their sacred books for contradictions and absurdities, and not without success. Proves that their God knew little about astronomy and less about geography, then sits him down over against the church, like Jonah squatting under his miraculous gourd vine in the suburbs of Nineveh, and confidently expects to see it collapse. He imagines that in pointing out a number of evident errors and inconsistencies in revealed religion, he has hit theism in its stronghold, but he hasn't. He has but torn and trampled the ragged vestment of religion, struck at non-essentials, called attention to the clumsy manner in which finite man has bodied forth his idea of infinity, has made the unskillful laugh and the judicious grieve. In an ignorant age, the supernatural appeals most powerfully to the people. Hence it is not strange that revealed religion, so-called, should have been grounded upon the miraculous. But the passage of the Red Sea, the raising of Lazarus, and the kindred works are not readily accepted in an enlightened era, and are utilized by scoffers to bring all religions into contempt. We can scarce conceive of God being reduced to the necessity of violating his own laws to demonstrate his presence and power. While it were presumption to ask any church to abate one jot or tittle of its dogma, it seems to me that all would gain by relying less upon the evidential value of the miracles, that a broader, nobler basis can be found for religious faith, one more in accord with the wisdom and dignity of the great All-Father, than tradition of signs and wonders in a foreign land in the long ago. Had God desired to personally manifest himself unto man, to deliver a code of laws, to establish a particular form of worship, it is reasonable to suppose that he would have done so in a manner that would have left no doubt in the mind of any man, of any age or clime, and at either his divinity or his desires. That he has not done this argues that all revealed religions are but the voices of the godlike within man, rather than direct revelations from without. All religions are fundamentally the same, and each is the highest spiritual concept of its devotees. Whence came the gods of the ancient Greek and Egyptian, of the Mede and Persian? If they were made known by direct revelation, how came they to be false gods? If they were the result of a spirit of worship inherent in all men, who implanted that spirit? If God, he must have done so for a purpose, and what purpose other than to enable man to work out his own salvation? Would we not expect him to operate through this spirit of universal guidance, rather than leave the world in darkness while he retired to an obscure corner thereof, and practiced ledger domain for the edification of a few half-civilized people? If we adopt the internal instead of the external view of the origin of Judaism and Christianity, all the other sacred books range themselves about the Bible and with it bear witness that man is a creature of design and not a freak of chance. We bring to confirm the teachings of Moses and Christ and the wise Zoroaster, the loving Guatanama, the patient Mohammed, the priests and prophets of every clime, the altars of every age, the countless millions who, since man's advent on the earth, have worshipped the all in all. If this be not basis broad enough for man's belief, Add thereto the story of God's wisdom, written in the stars, and the never-ceasing anthem of the sea. The history of every consecrated man who has died for man, whether his name be Christ or Damien. The song of every bird, and the gleam of every beauty. The eternal truth that shines in a mother's eyes. The laughter of little children, and the leonine courage of creation's Lord. Every burning tear that has fallen on the face of the dead, and every cry of anguish that has gone up from the open grave to the throne of the living God. Were not this revelation enough? Yet tis but the binding of humanity's sacred book, of that universal Bible in which God speaks from the age and from hour to hour to all who have ears to hear.
The fact that man desires immortality is proof enough that he was not born to perish. Tis a direct revelation to the individual, if he will but heed it, will get out of the grime and the man-created city, with its artificialities, into the God-created country where he may hear the still small voice, speaking to that subtler sense, which in animals is instinct, in man is inspiration. There is no error in the ordering of the universe. It was not jumbled together by self-created force, operating in accordance with laws self-evolved from chaos, on matter which, like Mrs. Stowe's juvenile nigger, just growed. It is the work of a master who ordereth all things well. Beauty might be born of chance, but only omniscience could have decreed the adoration it inspires. Hate might spring from the womb of chaos, but love must be the child of order. Pain might be begotten of monsters, but only infinite wisdom could have invented sorrow. Nature does not put feathers on fish, fins on birds, nor give aught that lives an impossible desire or an objectless instinct. Then why should man desire immortality? Why should he fear annihilation more than the fires of hell? During a third of his life he is unconscious, and annihilation is but an ever-dreamless sleep. Whether he sleeps the sleep of health or that of death, an hour and an eternity are the same to him. Yet he desires the one and dreads the other. If man's fierce longing for immortal life is not to be gratified, then is the whole universe a cruel lie, its wonderful arrangement from star to flower, its careful adaptation of means to ends, the provision for the satisfaction of every sense, an errant fraud, a colossal falsehood. If there be no God, then is creation a calamity. If there be a God, and no immortality for man, then it is a crime. God does not reveal himself to beasts, nor to men of brutish minds. How can those who have no ear for music, no eye for beauty, hear the melody of the universe, or comprehend the symmetry of the all? What need of those for immortality to whom love is only lust, charity a pander to pride, a full stomach the greatest good, and gold a god? It is these who become motive grinders, dig genius out of the earth like spuds and goobers, and achieve perpetual motion by making the universe a self-operative machine needing neither key nor steam generator to make it go. They pride themselves, sometimes justly, on their reasoning powers. But the product of their logic mill is like artificial flowers, as unprofitable as the icy kiss of the Venus de Medici. Of that knowledge gleamed in the veil of sorrow they know nothing. Of that wisdom which cannot be demonstrated by the laws of logic they have no more conception than has a mole of the glories of the morning. They are of the earth earthy. To make them understand a message, God would have had to typewrite it, add the seal of a notary public, and deliver it in person. They hear not the silver tones of Memnon, heed not the wondrous messages that come from the dumb lips of the dead. They search through musty tomes and explore long-forgotten languages to prove the rhapsodies of some old prophet false, while the grave of the babe that was buried yesterday is more than a prophecy, is an ark of the covenant. End of chapter 43 Evidences of Man's Immortality Recording by Jim Gallagher Chapter 44 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Chapter 44 The Professional Reformer. This is preeminently the era of the Reformer, and there are few things, great or small, upon which he has not tried his Archimedean lever with more or less effect. Progress should ever be the shibboleth of man, but progress and improvement are not always synonyms. When a man becomes possessed of an idea that differs materially from the ideas of mankind in general, when he takes issue with the cumulative wisdom of a world he knows not how many ages old, simple modesty would suggest that, before arrogating to himself superior discernment, 
he inquire diligently whether he is really a philosopher or a fool. When a man takes issue with the world, the chances are as one to infinity that he is wrong. Since man's appearance upon the earth, a great many sages have graced it, and the present generation is heir of all the ages. Its judgment is grounded upon the net result of thousands of years of careful study and costly experiment, and it is much safer to trust to it than to newborn theories. Occasionally a man appears who can add to the general stock of wisdom, but such men are seldom conscious of the fact that they are wiser than the world they live in, seldom consider that they have a special call to embark in a radical reform crusade. They know that society is an organism, not a machine, and that it cannot be violently transformed any more than a man can be changed into a demigod or a monkey into a mastodon. They realize that the old order changeth, yielding place to new. But they also realize that the change must be slow in order to be healthy. Nearly every change that the world has witnessed has been slowly, almost imperceptibly wrought. Even all governments that have stood the test of time were the work of time. The present government of England has been built up almost imperceptibly, and the Constitution of the United States is but a differentiation of Magna Carta, not a new and violent birth. It is much safer to change the old order of human thought and action by evolutionary than by revolutionary methods. It has been the custom of society for many ages to make woman the custodian of her own virtue. But in this age of reformers it has been discovered that this is a grievous mistake. According to the new school of morals, Woman is not competent to distinguish between right and wrong, and even wives of mature years are sometimes led astray by fell destroyers, whom the injured husband feels in duty bound to chase around the world, if need be, with a gatling gun. Instances where designing villains have invaded the sanctity of the home are multiplying, and while the world is not ready to forgive the erring woman, it is daily asked to anathematize her paramour and stand between her husband and the penitentiary, should his marksmanship prove successful. In other words, the world is asked to regard every man that a woman may chance to meet as her guardian angel, to place her honor in his keeping instead of her own, to crucify him should he not prove as indifferent as Adonis, as chaste as Joseph. Truly this is very complimentary to man, but quite the reverse to woman. It would substitute male for female virtue, and place the sanctity of the home at the mercy of strangers. Unquestionably, all men should be pure, but they are not. In fact, the pure man is the exception and not the rule. Every man who takes unto himself a wife must know this. He knows that he places his honor in the keeping of the woman, not in the keeping of his fellow men. He knows that she can live as pure as Diana if she elects to do so, that if she does not so choose, she will have no difficulty in finding companions in crime. He does know, as does the world, that no man will attempt to lead her astray so long as her deportment is such as becomes a true wife that no wolf in sheep's clothing will ever find his way into the fold without her assistance. It will not do. Every sane woman who has arrived at the age of discretion is the guardian of her own honor. To relieve her of this responsibility is to insult her intelligence. To divide the responsibility with men of the world is to place her on the same moral plane with the roué and the courtesan, ready to err should opportunity offer. It is a trifle strange that those good people who value female purity so highly that they would reform every roué in Christendom to secure it, have little or nothing to say about the chief cause of hymeneal infidelity, loveless marriages. No woman who really loves her husband can be untrue to him. Duty and inclination point the same way. But if a woman does not love her husband, she will, in nearly every instance, love someone else. She may never manifest this illicit affection by word or look, she may not admit it even to her own heart. But no matter how strongly armed she be in honesty, she stands within the pale of danger. From the questionable act of bartering, according to due forms of law and with priestly blessing, 
an attractive person for wealth or social position is a comparatively easy step to practices no more reprehensible, but wanting the sanction of society. Is it at all strange that an impulsive young woman, whose parents have persuaded her to marry a man she cordially detests, and who is perhaps four times her age, should conclude that moral codes are chiefly fashionable cant, and that a pretense of observing them is all that is really necessary? While the reformers are busy saving the world, it is strange that they do not devise some method of checking the decided misogamistic tendency of the young men of today. Marriages are becoming decidedly unpopular with them, and the result is that thousands of young men, who should be model husbands, are living lives of but quasi-respectability. Thousands of young women who should be honored wives and happy mothers are thrown upon their own resources, forced to choose between virtue and rags, and silks and shame. The latter soon learn that honest poverty brings almost as complete social ostracism, almost as much contumely, as dishonest finery, and, despairing of ever becoming true men's wives, too many of them become false men's mistresses. Here is work in abundance for the reformer. To it, O oh, ye saviors of the world, teach the young men of the land that marriage is a thing to be desired, even though they be not millionaires, and no heiress smiles upon them. The true reformer will not wait for some grand mission some mighty crusade to call him to action. The world is full of wrong which needs no preternatural prescience to discover, fraud which bears its name boldly upon its very face. The true reformer will denounce fraud and falsehood wherever found, will assail the wrong no matter how strongly entrenched it be in prescriptive right. But he will make haste slowly to change the fundamental principles upon which society is founded. He will proceed cautiously, modestly, until he does know, so far as aught is given to human wisdom to know, that it is a condition and not a theory with which he is dealing, that he can point the world to new truths whose recognition and adoption will make better the condition of his species. Then, if he be a true man, he will speak, not in humble whispers, lest he offend potentates and powers, not ambiguously, that he may escape the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, but in clarion tones, like another Peter the Hermit, who, bearing all, swerving neither to the right nor to the left, preached the crusade of the Holy Sepulchre, till at last his words of fire burned through dull understandings, into cold hearts, and steel-clad Europe quivered like a million globules of quicksilver, then massed beneath his ragged standard. End of chapter 44, The Professional Reformer. Recording by Brian Keenan. Chapter 45 of The Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by William Jones. Chapter 45. Trilby and the Trilbyites. Apotheosizing the Prostitute. The Trilby craze has overrun the land like the grip bacillus or the seven-year locust. Here in America it has become almost as disgusting as the plague of lice sent upon Egypt to eat the chilled steel veneering off the heart of Pharaoh the Fickle. Everything is trilby. We have trilby bonnets and bonbons, poses and plays, dresses and drinks. Trilby sermons have been preached from prominent pulpits, and the periodicals from penny post to pretentious magazine have trilby isthmus and have it bad. One would think that the world had just found salvation, so loud and unctuous is its hosanna, that trilby was some new Kaaba stone or greater palladium floated down from heaven on the wings of du maurier's transcendent genius that after waiting and watching for six thousand or million years a perfect exemplar has been bequeathed to the world i have read du maurier's foolish little book as a disagreeable duty 
the lot of the critic is an unenviable one he must read everything even such insufferable rot as coin's financial school and those literary nightmares turned loose in rejoinder verbal rosinantes each bearing a chop logic don quixote with pasteboard helmet and windmill spear i knew by the press comments i have already surmised from its popularity with upper tendom that Tribbley was simply a highly spiced story of female frailty hence i approached it with long teeth like a politician eating crow or a country boy is absorbing his first glass of lager beer i had received a surfeit of the chameleon style of literature in my youth before i learned with ecclesiastes the preacher or even with parkhurst that all is vanity so far as my experience goes the only story of a fallen woman that was worth the writing and reading is that of mary magdalene and it is not french her affairs d'amour appear to have ended with her repentance she did not try to marry a duke elevate the stage or break into swell society after closing her maison de joie she ceased to be bon camarade et bonne ville in the tough de tough quarter of the judean metropolis there were no more strolls on the battery by moonlight alone love after exchanging her silken robe de chambre for an old-fashioned nightgown with never a ruffle when she applied the soft pedal the bacchic revel became a silent prayer so far as we can gather the cultured gentlemen of judea did not fall over each other in a frantic effort to ensnare her with hymen's noose if the apostles recommended her life to the ladies of their congregation as worthy emulation the stenographer must have been nodding worse than homer if the elite of jerusalem named their daughters for her and made her the subject of public discussion that fact has been forgotten and yet it is reasonably certain that she was beautiful even more beautiful than trilby the bones of whose face were so attractive the pink of whose tootsie wootsies so irresistible the magdalen of st luke appears to have been in many respects the superior of the magdalen of du maurier she does not appear to have been an ignorant and coarse-grained she-gammon who frequented the students quarters of the sacred city posing to strolling artists for the altogether being in the crowded atelier like mother eve in eden naked and not ashamed we may suppose that the sensuous blood of the orient ran riot in her veins that she was swept into the fierce maelstrom by love and passion and would have perished there but for the infinite pity of our lord who cast out the seven devils that lurked within her heart like harpies in a grecian temple and still the storm that beat like sulphurous waves of fire within her snowy breast and behold a woman in the city which was a sinner when she knew that jesus sat at meat in the pharisee's house brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment how stale flat and unprofitable the modern stories of semi-repentant prostitutes beside that pathetic passage which shears down into the very soul penetrates to the profoundest depths of the sacred lake of tears and yet this ultra-orthodox age which would suppress the iconoclast if it could for poking fun at paul parrot preachers has not become crazed over mary magdalene has not so much as named a canal boat or cocktail for her du maurier says of his heroine with her it was lightly come and lightly go and never come back again sheer gaiety of heart and genial good fellowship the difficulty of saying nay to earnest pleading so little did she know of love's heartaches and raptures and torments and clingings and jealousies etc a woman who had never been in love yet confessed to criminal intimacy with three men and was not yet at the end of her string not even the pride of dress the scourge of need the fire-whips of passion to urge her on she sinned as the yankees would say simply to be a doin 
broke the seventh commandment more in a frolicsome spirit of camaraderie than anything else. That's the way we used to kill people in Texas. Still, I opine that when a young woman gets so awfully jolly that she distributes her favors around promiscuously just to put people in good humor, she's a shaky piece of furniture to make a fad of, a doubtful example to be recommended from the pulpit to America's young daughters. The French enthusiasts once crowned a courtesan in Notre Dame as goddess of reason and worshipped her but I was hardly prepared to see the American people enthrone another as goddess of respectability and become hysterical in their devotion. I am no he-prude. I have probably said as many kindly things of fallen womanhood as Du Maurier himself, but I dislike to see a rotten drab deified. I dislike to see a great publishing house like that of Harper and Brothers, so indifferent to decency, so careless of moral consequences, that for the sake of gain it will turn loose upon this land the foul liaisons of the French capital. I dislike to see the mothers of the next generation of Americans trying to make up to resemble the counterfeit presentiment of a brazen bawd. It indicates that our entire social system is sadly in need of fumigation, such as Sodom and Gomorrah received. Trilby, the child of a bummy preacher and a bastard barmaid, was born and bred in the slum of the wickedest city in the world. Little was to be expected of such birth and breeding. We are not surprised that she regards fornication as but a venial fault, like cigarette smoking, and sins capriciously, desultorily, more in frolicsome spirit of camaraderie than anything else. Girls so reared are apt to be a trifle frolicsome. We are not shocked to see her stripped stark naked in Carol's atelier in the presence of half a hundred hoodlums in the Latin Quarter, seeming as unconcerned as a society belle at opera or ball, with half her back exposed, her bust ready to spill itself out of her corsades if she chanced to stoop. We even feel that it is in perfect accord with the eternal fitness of things when these wild sprouts of Bohemia with kindly solicitude, help her on with her clothes. We can even pause to admire the experienced skill with which they put each garment in its proper place and deftly button it. That she should have the rival slang of the free and easy neighborhood at her tongue's end and be destitute of delicacy as a young cow might be expected but we are hardly prepared to see one grown-up among such surroundings so utterly stupid as not to know when her companions are guying her. Trilby croaking Ben Bolt for the edification of Les Trois Anglichés were a sight worthy of a lunatic asylum. It was even more ridiculous than the social performance of the other half-wit little Billy in Carol's atelier. Stupidity covers even more sins than charity, hence we should not judge Du Maurier's heroine too harshly, as weak intellects yield readily to hypnotic power. Svengali had an easy victim. I have no word of criticism for the poor creature. I do not blame Du Maurier for drawing her as he found, or imagined her, nor can I blame popular preachers, able editors, and half-wit women for worshipping the freckled and faulty grisette as a goddess. For does not Carlyle truly tell us that what we see and cannot see over is good as infinity? Still I cannot entertain an exalted opinion of either the intelligence or morals of a people who will place such a character on a pedestal and prostrate themselves before it. I confess my surprise at the phenomenal popularity of the book among people familiar with Dickens, Scott, and Thackeray, triune transcendent of fiction. I had hoped when Ben-Hur made its great hit that the golden age of flash fiction was past, that it could henceforward count among its patrons only stable boys and scullions. But the same nation that received Ben-Hur with tears of thankfulness thankfulness for a priceless jewel of spotless purity, ablaze with the immortal fire of genius, has gone mad with joy over a dirty tale of baudry that might have been better told by a cheap reporter bordering on the jim-jams. 
has the american nation suddenly declined into intellectual dotage reached the bald head and dizzy sobrette finale in the mighty drama of life i can account for the success of du maurier's book only on the hypothesis that like takes to like that the world is full of frail trilbies and half-baked duffers like little billy who narcissus like worship their own image they don't mind the contradictions and absurdities with which the book abounds in fact those who read up-to-date french novels are seldom gifted with sufficient continuity of thought to detect contradictions if they appear two pages apart the bulk is ultra bizarre a thin intellectual soup served in grotesque even impossible dishes and highly flavored with vulgar animalism just the mental pablum craved by those whose culture is artificial mentality weak and morals mere matter of form the plot was evidently loaded to scatter it is about as probable as jack in the beanstalk and has worked out with the skill of a country editor trying to cover a national convention the story affords about as much food for thought as one of talmage's plate matter sermons is fully as fillin as drinkin the froth out of a pop bottle and equally as exhilarating like other sots the more the literary bacchanal drinks the more he thirsts appetite increased by what it feeds upon we can forgive byron and boccaccio the lax morals of their productions because of their literary excellence just as we wink at the little social lapses of sarah bernhardt because of her unapproachable genius but du maurier's book is wholly bad it could only have been made worse by being made bigger it is a moral crime a literary abortion the style is faulty and the narrative marred if a bad egg can be spoiled by slaying logged in from the slums of two continents with evident labor employed naturally slang may serve in a pinch for attic salt but slang for its own sake is smut on the nose instead of a beauty spot on the cheek of venus sure evidence of a paucity of ideas a trite proverb a non-translatable phrase from a foreign tongue may be permissible but the writer who jumbles two languages together indiscriminately is but a pedantic prig it were bad enough if du maurier mixed good english with better french but he employs in his bilingual book the very worst of both obsolete american provincialisms and the patois of the quarter latin side by side to the cultured american who knows only the english of lindley murray and scholastic french the book is about as intelligible as greek to casca or the dog latin of the american schoolboy to julius caesar his characters resemble the distorted freaks of nature in a dime museum they may all be possible but not one of them is probable taffy and gecko are the best of the lot the first is a big good-natured englishman who wants to see his sweetheart married to his friend weds another and supports her quite handsomely by painting pictures he cannot sell the latter a pole with an italian's temperament yet who sees the woman he loves in the power of a demon by whom she is presumably debauched and makes no effort to rescue her is not even jealous Svengali is the greatest musician in the world yet cannot make a living in paris the modern home of art he is altogether and irretrievably bad despite the harmony in which his soul is steeped think of a hawk out warbling a nightingale of a demon flooding the world with melody most divine we may now expect mephistopheles to warble near my god to thee between the acts trilby can sing no more than a burrow like the useful animal she has plenty of voice and like him she can knock the horns off the moon with it or send it on a hot chase after the receding ghost of hamlet's sire but she is tone-deaf can't tell ophelia's plaint from the performance of thomas's orchestra svengali hypnotizes her and beneath his magic spell she becomes the greatest contratiste in europe 
Hypnotism is a power, but little understood. So we must permit Dumarier to make such Jules Verne excursions into that unknown realm as may please him. Had Svengali made a contortionist of the stiff old Devonshire vicar, we could not cry impossible. The laird of Cockpen is a good-natured fellow to whom Trilby tells her troubles instead of pouring them into the capacious ear of a policeman. He is a kind of bewhiskered Sir Galahad who goes in quest of Trilby instead of the Holy Grail, and having found her, sits down on her bed and cheers her up while she kisses and caresses him. As she is in love with his friend, the performance is eminently proper, quite platonic. The laird advises Trilby to give up sitting for the altogether, yet Dumarier assures us that nothing is so chaste as nudity. Let Venus herself, as she drops her garments and steps onto the model throne, leaves behind her on the floor every weapon by which she can pierce to the grosser passions of men. He informs us that a naked woman is such a fright that Don Juan himself were fain to hide his eyes in sorrow and disenchantment and fly to other climes. How thankful Cupid must be that he was born blind! Still, the most of us are willing to risk one eye on the average altogether model. Dumayer, who is somewhat better artist than author, illustrates his own book. He gives us several portraits of Trilby, all open mouthed with a vacant stare. Strange that he did not draw his heroine nude as she sat on the bed, hucking and kissing the laird, that he did not hang up on the floor every weapon by which Venus herself can pierce to the grosser passions of men but perchance he was afraid the laird would hide his eyes in sorrow and disenchantment and fly to other climes. He could not be spared just yet. Despite his plea for the nude, I think he exercised excellent judgment in leaving Trilby clothed and in her right mind, such as it was, while the laird roosted on her couch in that attic bedroom and was, to us a Tennysonianism, mouthed and mumbled, even New York's four hundred might have felt a little squeamish at seeing this pair of platonic turtle doves hid away in an obscure corner of naughty Paris in purus naturalibus, even if there is nothing so chaste as nudity. Dumouriez says that Trilby never sat to him for the altogether, and adds, I would soon have asked the Queen of Spain to let me paint her legs. If nudity be so chaste, and Trilby didn't mind the exposure even a little bit, why should he hesitate? And why should he not paint the legs of the Queen of Spain, or even the underpinnings of the Queen of Hawaii, as well as her arms? But if we pause to point out all the absurd contradictions in this flake of ultra-French froth, we shall wear out more than one pencil. Little Billy is a very nice young man, who has been kept too close to his mother's apron-strings for his own good. A girlish, hysterical kind of boy who should have been given spoon victuals and put to bed early. Of course he wants to marry Trilby, for he is of that age when the swish of a petticoat makes us seasick. She is perfectly willing to become his mistress, although she had repented of her sins and been forgiven, but just a few days before. She has sense enough, despite Dumouriez's portraits of her, to know that she is unworthy to become a gentleman's wife, to be mated with a he-virgin like little Billy, but she is over-persuaded as usual, and consents. When the young calf's mother comes on the scene and asks her to spare her little pansy blossom, not to blight his life with the frost of her follies, and of course she consents again. She's the great consenter, always in the hands of friends, like an American politician. The difficulty of saying nay to earnest pleading prevents a mesalliance. Trilby skips the tra-la, and little Billy, who has no chance to secure a reconsideration, cries himself sick, but recovers, comes up smiling like a cotton patch after a spring shower. He is taken to England, but fails to find that absence makes the heart grow fonder. He gets wedded to his art quite prettily, and even thinks of turning Mormon and taking the vicar's daughter for a second bride, but slips up on an atheistical orange peel. Something has gone wrong with his head. Where 
his bump of emotiveness should stick out like a walnut, there is a discouraging depression which alarms him greatly, and worries the reader not a little. But finally he sees Trilby again, and the wheel in his head, which has stuck fast for five years, begins to whiz around like the internal economy of an alarm clock, or a sky terrier with a clothespin on his tail. Of course, there is nothing now for Trilby to do but to die. They could be paired off in a kind of morganatic marriage, but it is customary in novels where the heroine has been too frolicsome for her to get comfortably buried instead of happily married, and perhaps it is just as well. Even a French novelist must make some little mock concessions to the orthodox belief that the wages of sin is death. So Trilby sinks into the grave with a song like the dying swan, and little Billy follows suit, upsets the entire Christian religion by dying very peaceably as an atheist, without so much as a shudder on the brink of that outer darkness where there is supposed to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Svengali has also fallen by the wayside. A number of characters have been very happily forgotten, so the story drags along to the close on three not very attractive legs, Taffy, the Laird, and Gecko. It is a bad drama, worse staged, with an ignorant bawd for a heroine, a weak little thing for a leading man, an impossible caliban for the heavy villain, and atheism for a moral. Such is the wonderful work that has given this alleged land of intelligence a case of literary mania a potu, set it to singing the praises of a grimy grisette more melodiously than she warbled. Miranton, Mirantain, at the bidding of the villainous Svengali. Such is this new line of literature who has set American maids and matrons to paddling about home barefoot and posing in public with open mouths, flattering themselves that they resemble a female whom they would scald if she ventured into their backyard. End of chapter 45 Trilby and the Trilbyites Chapter 46 of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1, by William Cowper Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by William Jones. Chapter 46 Balaam's Ass and Other Burrows. Sonnet by Alexander Pope Force first made conquest, and that conquest, law, Till superstition taught the tyrant awe, Then shared the tyranny, then lent it aid, And gods of conquerors slaves of subjects made. She from the rending earth and bursting skies Saw gods descend, and fiends infernal rise. Here fixed the dreadful, there the blessed abodes. Fear made her devils, and weak hope her gods. Gods, partial, changeful, passionate, unjust, Whose attributes were rage, revenge, and lust, Such as the souls of cowards might conceive, And formed like tyrants, tyrants would believe. Zeal, then, not charity, became the guide and hell was built on spite and heaven on pride end of poem by alexander pope kind reader have care for aught i know this article may be the rankest blasphemy and reading it may wreck your immortal soul granting of course that you are in possession of such perishable property i submitted it to several of my brother ministers and sought their opinion as to the propriety of publishing it. But while some assured me that it was calculated to purify the moral atmosphere somewhat, and foster respect for true religion, others were equally certain that Satan had inspired it, that it was in fact a choice bit of immigration literature for the lower regions. Finding even the elders unable to decide 
what should be done with Balaam's ass, whether it should be turned loose upon the land like another evangelist, or consigned to the flames as a hopeless heretic? I determined to give it the benefit of the doubt. The animal may break into the preserves of some unctuous hypocrites and trample a few choice flowers of sacerdotal folly, but I opine that no honest man of average intellect will find herein an occasion for complaint. I would not wantonly wound the sensibilities of those earnest but ignorant souls who believe the very chapter headings of the Bible to have been inspired, who interpret literally every foolish fable preserved therein like flies in amber. But the car of progress cannot roll forward without crushing an occasional pismire. We cannot bid it stand forever in the same old rut like an abandoned road cart or Jeffersonian Democrat, because across its shining pathway lie the honest prejudices of zealous stupidity. The Bible is a great gold mine in which inexhaustible store of yellow metal is mixed with much worthless rubbish that must be purged away by honest criticism before the book becomes really profitable, even fit for general circulation. I would rather place in the hands of an innocent girl a copy of the Police Gazette or Sunday Sun than an unexpurgated Bible. It is a book I value much, yet keep under lock and key with Don Juan and the Decameron. It contains both the grandest morality and most degrading obscenity ever conceived in the brain of mortal man. There are passages whose beauty and power might cause the heart of an angel to leap in ecstasy. Others that would call a blush of shame to the brassy front of the foulest fiend that ever howled and shrieked through the sulfurous valleys of hell. The man who rejects the Bible altogether, because it is honeycombed with barbarous traditions, rank with revolting stories and darkened by the shadow of a savage superstition, is cousin German to him that cast aside a priceless pearl because it is coated with ocean slime. He that accepts it in its entirety, gulps it down like an anaconda of serving an unwashed goat, who makes no attempt to separate the essential from the accidental, the utterance of inspiration from the garrulity of helpless nations, who forgets that it is half-epic poem, filled with the gorgeous imagery of the Orient, may, like the ass which Balaam rode, open its mouth and speak. But he never saw the angel of the Lord. He utters the words of emptiness and ignorance. Had the Bible been taught intelligently and truthfully, the entire world would have accepted it centuries ago. Its very worst enemies are those who insist on its inerrancy, who strive by some esoteric alchemy of logic to transmute its every fragment of base metal into bars of yellow gold the folly of the creature, into the wisdom of the Creator. During the Dark Ages, hidebound orthodoxy prevailed, and practically every man was a church communicant. It is paramount today only in those countries that have failed to keep pace with the car of progress. It is a sad commentary upon all religious faiths that they flourish best where ignorance prevails that atheism is rapidly becoming the recognized correlative of education. By presuming to know too much of God's great plan, by decrying intelligent criticism and attempting to seal the lips of living students with the dicta of dead scholastics, by standing ever ready to brand as blasphemers those who presume to question or dare to differ, the dogmatists are driving millions of God-fearing men into passive indifference or overt opposition. Ignorance is not a crime per se, but it is the mother of superstition and intolerance, those twin demons that have time and again deluged the world with blood and tears, 
that for forty centuries have stood like ravenous wolves in the path of human progress that with their empoisoned fangs have torn a thousand times the snowy breast of liberty that have done more to inspire doubt and foster infidelity than all the french philosophes that ever wielded pen the logical well-informed man who today becomes a church communicant does not do so because of the doctrine promulgated by the average pulpiteer but despite of it the long night of intellectual slavery has not altogether passed but on the higher hills already flame the harbingers of reason's glorious morn gone is the inquisition with its sacred infamies the christian rack is broken and the thumbscrew rusted in twain the persuasive wheel no longer whisks the nonconformist into full communion the iron virgin has ceased to press the writhing heretic to her orthodox heart the faggot has fallen from the hand of the saintly fanatic and the branding iron from the loving grasp of the benevolent bigot while superstition that once did rule the world with autocratic sway can only shriek her impotent curses forth and flourish her foolish boycott at reason's growing flame if i can but enable sectarians to understand that all so-called sacred books are essentially the same that brahma and baal jupiter and jehovah are really identical if i can but make them cognizant of the crime they commit in decrying honest criticism if i can but convince them that the man who is slave to no sect but takes no private road but looks through nature up to nature's god is not necessarily an active emissary of evil whom it is their duty to denounce if i can but create a suspicion in the minds of the clergy that perhaps they know no more of the omnipotent than do other men are possibly mistaking vile for benevolence gall for godliness and chronic laziness for a call to preach i will feel that these few hours expended grooming balaam's burrow have not been cast away our information concerning the rev mr balaam and his burrow is very limited although the latter was endowed with the gift of gab it appears to have spoken but once and then at the especial bidding of an angel which fact leads us to suspect that the voluble jackasses now extant have deteriorated at both ends since the days of their distinguished ancestor have parted with all their brain as well as with half their legs brother balaam does not appear to have syndicated his sermons or made any special bid for notoriety if he ever hired half-starved courtesans a la parkhurst to dance the can-can then hastened into court to file complaint against the very bods he had filled with booze and dandled naked on his knee if he called the ladies of his congregation old sows after the manner of sam jones if he got himself tried on a charge of heresy or became entangled with some half-wit sister whose religious fervor led her to mistake levite for the lord no record of the shameful circumstance has been preserved he appears to have attended pretty strictly to the prophet business and we may assume from such stray bits of his biography as have come down to us that he prospered the israelites who had gotten out of egypt between two days with considerable of the portable property of other people concealed about their persons had gone into the bill dalton business under the direct guidance as they claimed of their deity and were for some time eminently successful wholesale murder and robbery became their only industry arson and oppression their recognized amusement they had swiped up several cities leaving not a soul alive and were now grinding the snickers snee for moab and midian the people of the petty nations of palestine whom god's anointed received an imperative command to utterly destroy 
had builded them happy homes and accumulated considerable property by patient industry they appeared to have been peacefully disposed and devout worshippers of those deities from whom the better attributes of jehovah were subsequently borrowed the israelites had not struck a lick of honest labor for forty years they had drifted about like coxey's common wheelers and developed into the most fiendish mob of god-fearing gorillas and marauding cutthroats of which history makes mention compared with joshua's murderous jews the huns who followed attila were avatars of mercy and the sioux of sitting bull were good samaritans a careful comparison of crimes committed by the kurds in armenia with those perpetrated by god's chosen people in palestine will prove that the followers of allah are but amateurs in the art of outrage doubtless any other people brutalized by centuries of bondage then turned loose without king or company with only ignorant prophets for guides and avaricious priests for lawgivers would have become equally cruel would have adopted a divinity devoid of mercy and a stranger to justice the god of a people is and must of necessity ever be a reflection of themselves an idealization of their own virtues and vices a magic mirror in which narcissus like man worships his own image the jews are one of the grandest people that ever dwelt upon the earth a more intellectual and progressive race is unknown to human history but like all others it had its age of savagery and its epoch of barbarism before it reached the golden era of civilization i am not criticizing the jews for their treatment of the canaanites during that century when crass ignorance made them credulous and bondage rendered them brutal but to assume that the excesses of semi-savages were heaven inspired or a damning libel of the deity i rather enjoy being lied about by malicious lollipops but did i sit secure in some celestial citadel holding the thunderbolts of heaven within my hand it were hardly safe to assert that i instigated such unparalleled atrocities as were perpetrated by the emancipated israelites in palestine i would certainly be tempted to take a pot-shot at an occasional preacher who persisted in defaming me with his foolish dogmatism balak the king of moab and midian saw that he was not strong enough to withstand the sacred marauders and well knew that surrender meant a wholesale massacre that those who had dared to defend their homes would be placed under harrows of iron that the silvery head of the aged grandsire would sink beneath a sword wielded in the name of god that unborn babies would be ripped from the wombs of moabite women and the maidens of midian coerced into concubinage by their heaven-led captors in this dire extremity balak bethought him of brother balaam who was not a prophet of god as popularly supposed but a priest of baal the deity devoutly worshipped in moab and midian it were ridiculous to suppose that the king princes and elders of moab and midian would appeal for aid to the god of their enemies instead of to their own divinity for in those days the principal business of a deity was to wage war in behalf of his worshippers balaam was a midianite and balak sent messengers to him with the reward of divination in their hand and begged that he would kindly come over and knock the israelites off the christmas tree with one of his smooth-bore muzzle-loading maledictions for said he with a pious fervor that proves he was addressing a priest of his own faith i wot that he whom thou blesseth is blessed and whom thou curseth is cursed he evidently believed that balaam carried the celestial thunderbolts concealed about his person that when he turned them loose those on whom they alighted frizzled up 
like a fat angleworm on a sea-coal fire the good man said he would see what could be done to help balak out of the hole and god came to balaam and said what men are these with thee as balaam was evidently expecting the visit we may conclude that the caller was baal as jehovah was not at that time on visiting terms with the gentile priest and was busily engaged in pulling down their altars and putting them to the sword balaam gratified the very natural curiosity of his celestial visitor and the latter after learning all the particulars cautioned his diviner or priest not to make any bad breaks balaam sent the ambassador back with the word that baal was a trifle shy of curses at that particular time balak evidently understood the situation for he sent other agents with larger offerings balaam still insisted that he had received no permission to wipe up the plain of moab with the ex-brick builders but saddled his ass and went along promising to do the best he could for his bleeding country he evidently desired to size up the situation and be quite sure that none of his curses would come home to roost doubtless he also desired to see if balak was bidding all he could afford for celestial aid for we have no reason to believe that brother balaam was in the prophet business for his health or peddling curses for recreation while en route his companions probably informed him that the jews were as frequent as jugs in a prohibition precinct that they had slaughtered the people of ai driven og from the earth overcome ammon and were making the rest of the canaanitish nations hard to catch for the good man was seized with a sudden desire to take the back track his burrow balked and balaam told his fellow travellers that an angel was interfering with his transportation facilities perhaps the princes of moab made ribald remarks anent the celestial obstruction even hinted that balaam had best get a maud s move on him or he might contract a vigorous case of unavailing regret then the burrow began to blab like many of the old pagan priests balaam was doubtless an adept in the art of ventriloquism that may have convinced the ambassadors and bulled the price of curses for then as now it was no uncommon thing for the utterance of an ass to be mistaken for that of an oracle or some doubting thomas may have twisted the burrow's tail for some reason not set forth by the sacred chronicler the angel withdrew his objections and the prophet proceeded on his way but still protesting that no permit had been accorded him to put a kibosh on joshua's freebooters balaam was entirely too smart to pray for rain when the wind was in the wrong quarter altogether too smooth to launch his anathemas at an army he knew could take moab by the back hair and rub their noses in the sawdust he counted the campfires of israel and concluded that balak's promises of high honors were worth no more than a camp meeting certificate of conversion that he would soon be hoofing it over the hills with his coat tails full of arrows so after working his patrons for all the spare cash in sight he made a sneak leaving his sovereign to wage war without the aid of supernatural weapons like many of his sacerdotal successors balaam took precious good care to get on the winning side ever since the days of brother balaam there has been considerable trading of curses for cold cash the industry has been patiently built up from humble beginnings to a magnificent business from an itinerant curse peddler trotting about on a spavine burrow and resorting to the methods of the monte bank to create a market for his merchandise it has become a vast commercial concern with costly establishments in every country the first curses as might have been expected were very crude affairs little more than hoodoos intended to promote the material welfare of the purchaser at the expense of other people a king of ye olden times bought a curse and turned it loose upon his enemies 
played the god and engine in his foe, much as a modern prince might a gatling gun, but it seems to have slowly dawned upon the royal ignorami that the lord is usually on the side of the heaviest battalions, a fact which Napoleon emphasized. The practice of fencing in a nation with a few wild-eyed prophets, or sending a single soldier forth with a hair-trigger hoodoo and the jawbone of a defunct jackass to drive great armies into the earth, gradually fell into disuse. Curses and blessings became a drug in the market. About this time, the Jewish priesthood began to take kindly to the doctrine of future rewards and punishments. This theological thesis, promulgated before the age of Abraham, had influenced to some extent the religious thought of the entire eastern hemisphere. That the Jews were among the last to admit the immortality of the soul was doubtless due to the fact that, because of their long enslavement, they did not emerge from semi-savagery so soon as did the other divisions of the great Semitic family. Furthermore, for a long period after their emancipation, the Jews seem to have received the rewards of their peculiar virtues here on earth, and were little inclined to defer their happiness to the hereafter, were amply able to punish their enemies, and had no occasion to delegate that pleasant duty to superior power. Finally, however, the fortunes of war began to go against them. They were no longer able to make on earth a heaven for themselves and a hell for other people. Instead of despoiling others, they discovered an occasional hiatus in their own smokehouse. Instead of burning the cities of their inoffensive neighbors, their own began to blaze. The priests and prophets insisted that these evils befell them because they had neglected their deity. But the more devout they became, the more fat kids, fine meal, and first fruits they referred to the Levite larder as offerings to the Lord, the more deplorable became their condition. The people began to drift to the more reasonable religion of their neighbors, and even the wisest of their kings could not be held to the faith of their fathers. The Jewish priesthood gradually adopted the old Parsi doctrine of heaven and hell, a doctrine unrecognized by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and having no place in the theology of Moses. The Jews eventually discovered that robbery was wrong and assassination a crime, that the practice of ripping open pregnant women and putting prisoners of war under harrows of iron was displeasing to the Lord. It was a forcible illustration of the ancient axiom that it makes a great difference whose ox is gored. Instead of founding a mighty nation, as predicted by their prophets, the Jews were conquered, scattered, enslaved. Palestine was filled with foreigners, had become a religious babel, a theological chaos. The time was ripe for a religious revolution such as had been inaugurated in India six centuries before. It was accomplished, and as might have been expected, the result was a curious composition, a religious ola podrida in which the profound wisdom of Zoroaster and the childish superstition of Western barbarians, grand morality and monumental absurdity elbow each other like spectres in a delirium, in which is heard both the still small voice of omnipotent God and the megalophonous bray of Balaam's ass. Jehovah, the national god of the Jews, supplanted Jove and Baal, Ashtaroth and Oromazdes, and with their thrones took many of their attributes. The doctrine of future rewards and punishments became the cornerstone of the new theology, while further concessions were made to ethnic creeds in various stages of decay by the adoption of the Trinity, Incarnation, and Resurrection. The Jewish prophets were accepted by the composite cult, which Christ may have originated, but certainly did not develop, but their every utterance was given a new interpretation of which the Hebrew hierarchy had never dreamed. 
The great kingdom which they had predicted was to be spiritual instead of temporal. The Jerusalem predestined to become the capital of a powerful prince, to whom all nations should acknowledge allegiance and pay tribute, was not the leprosy-eaten old town among the Judean hills, but a city not made with hands, existing eternal in the heavens. Christianity does not contain a single original idea. It borrowed liberally on every hand, but chiefly of Parseism, in which faith, as taught by Zoroaster, Aristotle says 6,000 years before Plato, may be found its most important features. It owes absolutely nothing to Judaism but the name of its God and an idle string of misinterpreted prophecies. It is, from first to last, essentially a Gentile faith. There never was a religion instituted upon the earth that the priesthood failed to transform into errant folly, to debase until it finally fell into disrepute. Such was the fate of that established by Zoroaster, and upon the ruins of the grandest theology this world has known, Siddhartha Gautama erected the Buddhist credo, which is really a revolt to first principles, a search for happiness here on earth the attainment of nirvana. So, too, the priesthood has corrupted the teachings of Christ until the logical mind revolts from the jumble of self-evident absurdities, rejects revelations as a nursery tale, and seeks by the dim light of science to find the cause of all existence. The new cult was not regarded kindly by the old priesthoods, and the methods adopted for its suppression were almost as rigorous as those it in turn employed some centuries later for the discouragement of other blasphemers and heretics. Hence, it is not surprising that the old Hebrew doctrine that whom the Lord loves he makes mighty, gives wealth and plenty, and concubines galore, power over his enemies, and privilege to despoil his neighbors, should have been early transformed into whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. The doctrine of temporal rewards and punishments revived somewhat as Christianity became powerful, but has remained a subordinate feature. As not a sparrow falls to the earth without a special permit from the Almighty, it follows as a natural sequence that every brutal crime is gracefully permitted if not ordained by that dear lord whose protection we daily pray and whose apostles we support if we inquire why this is so we are cautioned not to commit blasphemy some worthy brother of balaam's ass bids us beware the angel of the lord the claim of the ancient priesthoods to support was based on the presumption that they promoted the national welfare of the people by keeping the national deity in good humor. Whenever he contracted a case of assaults, the smell of fresh blood would usually bring him around all right. Sometimes the butchery of a few innocent birds and beasts would do the business, but it not infrequently became necessary to commit a number of homicides to get him actually gay. When even the sweet incense of blazing cities and roasting babes fail to restore his hilarity the prophet sounded the alarm much as the weather bureau gives warning of approaching cyclones and other atmospheric disturbances in the case the dire predictions failed to materialize the lord had listened to their protestations that he was not doing the proper thing and repented him the immutable had changed his mind the prophets were supposed to make a man prosperous as a Tammany politician by blessing, or poor as a Houston Post editorial by laying a curse upon him. As civilization advanced, the people, able to pay the rewards of divination, became too intelligent to be taken in by the transparent tricks of Brother Balaam. Hence the new priesthood devoted itself chiefly to the spiritual welfare of the people, made a specialty of the hereafter business. For obvious reasons, it is the safer enterprise. 
Man was now told to believe thus and so, and he would be blessed eternally. But if he believed not, he would be cursed everlastingly. The rewards promised by the early priesthoods had, by centuries of evolution, developed from good crops and fat cattle, fruitful vines and successful villainy, into mansions in heaven. The punishment from a protracted drought or a descent of the Assyrians, a bad case of buck egg or boils, into a hell of fire where the souls of aged unbelievers and unbaptized babes forever burn. This was the old argumentum ad hominem in a new mother hubbard. But the masses were still ignorant, and those who could not be bribed with the fruits of heaven were bluffed with the fires of hell. The old priesthoods were crushed, and kings became the sworn defenders of the new faith, even propagated it with the sword dispensed saving grace with gallows ropes and with the bludgeon drove heaven-inspired precepts into the heads of unbelievers wisdom could not withstand such logic the philosopher yielded to the unanswerable argument of the inquisition as no one could disprove the comforting doctrine of eternal damnation and there is a strong vein of superstition in even the best of men the ignorant populace cowered in terror most pitiful at the feet of a presumptuous priesthood and to this good day men who have managed in some mysterious manner to dodge the madhouse believe that priests or preachers are the special deputies of the deity that a criticism of the clergy is an insult to the almighty that if you dare dissent from the foolish opinions of some wooden-headed dominus anent the divine plan, you might as well curse God and die. Once this old ethnic cult in a new dress became well established, and the source of considerable revenue to the latter-day Levites, its most glaring absurdities were able to withstand for a time even the invention of the printing press and the general dissemination of knowledge for that monster custom of habits devil is very potent in shaping the minds of men and retarding human progress thus we find in this so-called enlightened age millions of men defending the rights of certain scorbutic families of indifferent minds and muddy morals to sway the sovereign's scepter mental colossi men who tower up like titans in the world of intellect are proud to acknowledge themselves the dutiful subjects of some brainless fop or beery old female who chanced to be born in a royal bed while their betters were ushered in as the brats of beggars so too we find men possessing clear judicial minds defending with all the fervor of fifteenth century fanatics not the christian faith per se but some special interpretation thereof not the philosophy of religion but the inconsequential theorems of some sacerdotal reformer who is added to the world's discord by founding a new faith these various religious divisions have become little more than rival commercial establishments each peddling its own peculiar brand of saving grace warranted the only genuine and dealing damnation round on all dissenters dogmatism begat doubt and men began to study the bible not to search out its wisdom and its truth but its folly and its falsehood they represent the recoil from one extreme to the other from blind belief to unreasoning skepticism from intellectual slavery to liberty degenerated into license. Instead of judging the Bible by God, they judge the God by the Bible, and finding by this ridiculous formula that he is little better than a brutal maniac, they reject him altogether, and try to account for the creature without the creator, to explain an effect without an efficient cause. If we could but muzzle the dogmatist's infidelity would quickly die. The essentials 
of the Christian religion do not depend upon the inerrancy of the scriptures. They do not depend upon direct revelation or the miracle, the incarnation or the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. In fact, these very evidences adduced in behalf of the true faith produce all the doubt with which it is called to contend. Let us grant that Moses was not called to Sinai's flaming crest to receive laws promulgated centuries before Joseph was carried a captive into Egypt, that the Bible is but the history of a barbarous people, a compendium of their poetry, religion, and philosophy, that the incarnation and resurrection are but myths borrowed from decaying ethnic cults, and what have we lost? Simply indefensible non-essentials the tawdry garment with which ignorance has bedecked her poor idea of the infinite. What matters it whether we call our creator Jehovah or Jupiter, Brahma or Buddha? Who knoweth the name by which the seraphim address him? Why should we care whether Christ came into the world with or without the intervention of an earthly father? Are we not all sons of the Most High God, bright sparkles of the infinite? Suppose that the story of the Incarnation, older than Jerusalem itself, be literally true, that the Almighty was the immediate father of Mary's child. Is not the birth of each and all of us as much a mystery, as great a miracle, as though we sprang full-grown from the brow of Olympian Jove? Is it necessary that the Creator should violate his own laws to convince us that he does exist? Is it more wonderful that the sun should stand still upon Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ajalon than the great world should spend forever, bringing the night and the morning, the seed time and the harvest? Is not a miracle, an interruption of nature's harmony, rather calculated to make a man of logical mind suspect that he is the sport of chance than believe himself the special character of an omniscient power? that ordereth all things well? When this great globe hangs motionless in space, and the rotting dead arise in their cerements, when the great multitudes are fed with a few small fishes, and virgins are found with child, then, and not till then, will I relinquish faith in an intelligent architect, and acknowledge lawless force the only deity. Man is but a microbe lost in immensity. He peers about him, and, by the uncertain light of his small intelligence, reads here a word, there a line in the great book of nature, and putting together these scattered fragments, makes a faith which he defends with fanatical fervor. Dare to call in question its most inconsequential thesis, and you are branded as a heretic. Deny it in toto, and you are denounced as an enemy of the Almighty. The curses of Brother Balaam no longer kill the body, but they are expected to play sad havoc with the soul. When the priest of Baal was en route to Moab's capital for cursing purposes, an angel tried to withhold him, and even his burrow rebuked him. But neither angels nor asses are exempt from the law of evolution. Now, when a priest or preacher lets slip a curse at those who presume to question the supernal wisdom of his creed, the angels are supposed to flap their wings until heaven is filled with flying feathers, while every blatant jackass who takes his spiritual fodder at that particular rick unbraids his ears and brays approvingly. End of chapter 46 Balaam's Ass End of the Complete Works of Brand the Iconoclast, Volume 1 of 12.